Hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much for uh, joining. Um, those who are here face to face with us in Brussels, uh, but also there are uh, quite a few who are joining online. So uh, it's great to be able to do both. Um, thank you for coming to this uh, event. Thank you to our host, uh, Mr. Christophe Lefebvre from the European Economic and Social Committee, who will say a few words uh, afterwards. Um, I just wanted to say maybe um, a few words about why uh, EASPD is involved in this project, uh, uh, but also what we're trying to achieve and why it's so important for, for creating jobs for people with disabilities. So um, EESPD, for those who don't know, is the European Association of Service Providers for Persons with Disabilities. And we represent around 20 to 25,000 organizations, uh, often local social economy organizations in 41 uh, different uh, countries, so really uh, all around uh, Europe. Uh, and what we try and do is to make sure that uh, as support services for people with disabilities, we can um, basically enable people with disabilities to live the lives they want to, to live. Uh, but to do that, we need to have the right policies that can help us uh, put that in place. Um, at ESPD, uh, when we talk about employment, it all starts from the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, uh, which basically um, explains and presents that um, people with disabilities have the same right as everybody else. And that means, of course, the right to work and employment, but not just the right to work and employment, but the right to work and employment on, on equal basis to others, meaning the same choices and the same opportunities as everyone else. Uh, what that means for states parties is that they need to put in place uh, the, the policies and the structures that can enable people with disabilities to take play, part on the uh, labor market. Um, so that's the theory in some way. That's the that's what we want to achieve. That's the UN Convention. That's what our, our governments have have a, have agreed to, to to sign up to and implement. Um, but the reality is is quite different to that. Uh, we see around Europe the uh, on average employment rate is around fifty percent for people with disabilities, compared to around seventy five percent for uh, for the general population, which means that the the, the employment gap is around twenty five points uh, difference. Um, so that's already not great news, but when you look into the detail on top of that, the situation is, is in some ways also even dire. Um, the quality of the jobs is not always great. Um, there are uh, real issues around uh, gender equality as well. The situation of women with disabilities is, is far worse than it is for, for, for men as well. Uh, and then it also the situation is uh, harder for people, for example, with intellectual disabilities, with autism uh, and so forth. So there's, there's a lot behind the statistics. Uh, and even though the statistics are not great, um, the reality is probably uh, far uh, dire. And so uh, what we need and what we try and, and push for uh, is uh, for public authorities to create inclusive labor markets. But to do that, you need to have a series of policies that can enable that to work. Uh, that starts with anti-discrimination policy. Of course, you can't discriminate, but that's only the, the starting points of it. Uh, what you also need is um, employers who uh, have the right uh, tools that can enable them to employ people with disabilities. Uh, that can mean, uh, for example, uh, working with um, public employment services. Um, that can mean working with social economy enterprises, supported employment services. That means having reasonable accommodation measures. Uh, it means uh, many of these uh, aspects. Uh, it also means um, having the right, uh, let's say, policies and the right legal frameworks that can enable it to happen. So, for example, um, uh, how in how many countries are uh, public authorities uh, providing uh, subsidies to companies, for example, uh, when they employ people with disabilities to cover some of these costs that, that can arise, for example, reasonable accommodation or loss of productivity or, or other elements like this. Uh, the reality, as we see, is that policymakers aren't really also putting in place these policies, or at least they aren't very ambitious with how these policies uh, are being uh, are being used. And that needs to change to, to really make a difference. Um, and last but not least, uh, public procurement, which is why we're uh, here today, is a major tool that can really make a difference. It represents 14% of the European GDP. So that's billions and billions and billions of money uh, spent. And what it means, it, what it, what public procurement generally means is basically uh, it's how and when public bodies uh, buy private services. Basically, it can be buying pens like this. It can be buying gardening services. It can be buying uh, research. It can be buying uh, whatever. Um, and public procurement is regulated at European level. Um, 
primarily to enable, uh, let's say, a, a single market and for, fair competition for companies around the single market. Uh, and that's, uh, of course, a good starting point. Um, and the EU Public Procurement Directive also provides many opportunities to buy social, to enable um, uh, the, the creation of jobs for persons with disabilities through public procurement. And we will go into a bit detail into how that can work in practice later. So the EU Public Procurement Directive offers lots of opportunities for uh, for the creation of uh, of jobs uh, for people with disabilities but what we see is that on the ground uh, public authorities local local authorities regional authorities national authorities they don't really make the most of uh, these frameworks and of the potential for uh, let's say socially responsible public procurement they usually go for the cheaper cheapest price and in the simplest way possible avoiding what they see as maybe more complex procedures even though these more complex procedures can have uh, other externalities and other added value uh, too. Um, so effectively, uh, we have high unemployment rates for people with disabilities. Um, public authorities and, and, and state parties have to create more inclusive labor markets. The EU is providing a tool that is public procurement that can help this to put in place, but it's not happening. So what we are trying to do through this project is basically uh, helping uh, public authorities, in particular local authorities, to know and understand how uh, public procurement can work and how they can, um, let's say, buy social and by doing so, um, create more opportunities for people with disabilities on the labor market. And by learning how things are happening in different countries, we can bring it all uh, together. And that is, in short, uh, why this project is taking uh, place. And of course, uh, our colleagues will, will talk a bit more about this uh, moving forward, but that's the, the gist of it. Um, Christoph, yeah. um, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you. A few words, a lot of things has been uh, said. Uh, just to um, remember that the EU signed the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in uh, 2006. And uh, we know that uh, people with disabilities represent around uh, one-sixth of the EU overall working age population, but the employment rate is uh, comparatively uh, very low. Um, so, of, of course, we must access, assess that uh, equal access to quality education and lifelong learning enables disabled, disabled people to, to participate fully uh, in uh, society and improve their, their quality of life. And regarding myself, my, I'm, so my name is Christophe Lefebvre. I'm uh, chairing the permanent um, study group on disability rights. We are composed of, uh, this group is composed of uh, various uh, ESC section covering uh, different policies area and representing employers, workers, and uh, uh, diversity Europe groups. The, the goal of this group is, um, the goals of the, this group are to provide a forum for the civil society perspective, part particularly for the disabled uh, persons organization. And I'm very pleased to, to see that uh, uh, there's a lot of organization uh, here in this place uh, with uh, a lot of people coming from Various, uh, various place. And uh, the, the other um, objective of this group is to assess and get a reaction on progress on the implementation of the uh, United Nations Convention on, on the rights of persons with disabilities. Um, in fact, very concretely, we are, we are doing a lot of audits uh, during the, the year uh, in the various places, uh, in the various countries in, uh, in Europe to check about uh, the good uh, good practice and, of course, bad practice that done. And uh, we used to participate to the, to the UN Convention every uh, year in, the, in June, where we can report uh, our activities to the, to the United Nations and also take a lot of experience from all of the, the organization that uh, use like like your your organization that used to uh, to work and and, and a lot of um, of uh, possibilities and of course we all we 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 uh, try to to keep any any uh, information that uh, that can uh, enable a more more uh, place to work for workers, but also uh, some difficulties. For example, I'll, recently I, I learned that, uh, particularly in, in in Africa, when the the theme of the conference was in Africa, where of course the the culture uh, is is also sometimes a difficulty for 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 example for women to access to a, a very modern mobile phone to uh, to learn to uh, to work and to uh, to uh, be uh, help regarding uh, any any uh, disability. I will stop there. Good good. Uh, I mean, I will stay here and uh, take of of course uh, note of uh, every everything that can I can. Uh, 
get from this uh, this forum. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christophe, uh, for those words. Um, for us, at least at the ESPD, being based in Brussels, the European Economic and Social Committee, which you're representing here together, which brings together the employers, so the businesses and sorts, the trade unions, the workers, and also civil society is a real ally in 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 uh, shaping EU policies to make it more inclusive, uh, including public procurement. So it's really uh, great that we can work together to push uh, for this. I would also be in New York for the COSP, uh, so maybe we can also organize something together uh, there also. Um, so now going into, uh, let's say, the the topic um we have uh, uh three stages in the afternoon we will start with uh, an introduction to this project by uh, my colleague miguel who will be joining us on on stage uh, now uh, afterwards we will go in to look a little bit more on the ground what's happening uh, locally uh, in terms of um, good practices uh, so we'll be going uh, to austria to belgium to france and across europe in perspective in terms of identifying the good practices that exist uh, and then afterwards, we'll be going more into what next uh, is this project uh, today? Is it because it's the final comment? Is it the end of what we're going to be doing on this topic, or is it maybe the beginning, or is it you know one more step in terms of uh, of trying to create more inclusive labour markets? So we'll be discussing this together with some key uh, stakeholders. Um, so that's it for me. I would like to ask Miguel to join. Miguel's on my right. Um, Miguel, um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Miguel Buitrago. I work at the ASPD. Uh, so I will be introducing the CORES project, uh, Community Resilience Through Social Procurement. Uh, but before I dive in into the project and object objectives, I would like to start with some uh, initial definitions on the topic uh, that we'll be discussing today in first place, uh, our understanding on public procurement, which is the purchase of services and goods uh, carried out by public authorities, such as government departments and or local authorities. Um, public procurement has uh, an impact, a uh, huge economic impact in the European Union, considering that it uh, accounts for around 14% of the GDP every year. In this sense, it is a mechanism to pursue social outcomes. Uh, and particularly, that's where the socially responsible public procurement comes in place. Uh, in simple terms, I will define it as uh, the introduction of social criteria for awarding and the performance of a public contract aimed at, among other things, promoting employment opportunities for disadvantaged groups, uh, including in the open labor market and through accessible and inclusive work environments, supporting social inclusion and social economy organizations by offering contracting authority, uh, contracting opportunities to firms such as nonprofit organizations, cooperatives, and social enterprises, and promoting ecological practices. So with that in mind, uh, this project was developed, and uh, the CORES project ran from uh, April, from May 2022 to April 2024. It has been funded by the European Union Single Market Program, SMP COSME. Uh, and the rationale was to help the local economy through the use of socially responsible public procurement to create new job opportunities for persons with disabilities and other vulnerable groups. Uh, the partners, well, uh, led by ESPD, the CORES project is made of seven partners for, who are spread across different European countries, uh, forming a multidisciplinary partnership uh, coordinated by ESPD and joined by uh, Centrum for Social uh, from Austria, uh, VAG from Germany, NASO from Bulgaria, and the city of Dobrich in Bulgaria, the city of Gleisdorf in Austria, and the city of Marina de Cudeo in Spain. Um, in our methodology, we aim at supporting the exchange of good practices and enhance the interregional collaboration uh, between social economy organizations and local regional authorities at the, uh, the European level, for which we have set four objectives. Number one, building the capacity of local and regional authorities in designing and implementing uh, socially responsible public procurement, actively collecting and circulating good practices to maximize the use of SRPP and increase employment rate of persons with disabilities. Three, building awareness on the positive impact of SRPP at the local level and setting up a mutual learning network to create synergies among stakeholders. For that, we did several activities, but I will focus on a few of them. In first place, which started our work, uh, was the research. 
uh, um, a report on socially responsible public procurement, uh, which has the objectives to identify how public authorities can promote inclusive and quality employment opportunities for persons with disabilities through uh, the public procurement cycle. Uh, explore how public act authorities can implement disability inclusion component in public tenders. Present promising practices from across Europe, reflecting on cases uh, where public procurement has been used to uh, promote quality employment and inclusion for persons with disabilities. Uh, and analyze the employment of persons with disabilities in line with the UNCRPD uh, and the general comment number eight. For, from which we have developed a set of criteria that local authorities could use to ensure that the employment for persons with disabilities and other disadvantaged groups are fair and in line with the UNCRPD and human rights, uh, for which we had set four different categories where we developed, uh, where we mentioned type of employment, the choice, the synergies, and uh, equal conditions to others. Um, from there, we moved on to try to discuss about what we have found our findings. So we organized a conference in a small city in Austria called Kaiser, which is a member of our project. Uh, and it fully followed our, uh, the intention of this project to look, uh, develop, uh, promote local development. Uh, instead of doing it in a big city like Vienna or Graz, we went to Kaiser and we tried to bring in the European uh, perspective and we discuss with stakeholders about the needs and challenges not only for uh, procurement, but also for persons with disabilities. And uh, from there, we had a synthesis of key messages that we were collecting, also the experience from the project. And we developed a declaration on socially responsible public procurement, uh, which main objective was to call on local authorities to make the most of SRPP, as set out in the European Union Public Procurement Directive to generate employment opportunities for persons with disabilities in the open labor market and to promote social inclusion and sustainable growth at the local level. Uh, from these two experiences, we understood that it was necessary for us to bring in to the local level, to uh, bring in this experience and the knowledge we have been gathering with the practices and discuss it at the local level with stakeholders. So our partners, city partners from Marina de Cudello, Gleiser and Dobrich organized local roundtables uh, in which they invited different uh, stakeholders, both in the local and regional area uh, to discuss about the niche challenges and the way forward to improve the conditions of persons with disabilities and uh, creating opportunities for them in the labor market uh, through the use of public procurement. Uh, from this, uh, the synthesis of these meetings that uh, where there was exchange of the good practices and the feedback from the local and regional uh, stakeholders, the synthesis was the development of uh, local action plans in which the cities uh, organize, uh, in which the cities present areas to work on to improve their procurement practices. Uh, and to have a roadmap for the future on how to implement uh, this experience, these lessons learned. Uh, for instance, in Dobridge, the action plan emphasized further improvement on rescaling of the, uh, of the skills and competence of the contracting authorities to effectively Im implement SRPV principles. And in Gleisdor, in Envisage, the strengthening interregional cooperation at all levels, and also try to include it into uh, green practices. So, uh, from this experience, after evaluating and reflecting everything we have done in the project, uh, we created a document uh, that we call Promoting Inclusive Employment Through Socially Responsible Public Procurement, which synthesized all our experience throughout the project and all the recommendations we have created uh, based on our experience and what we have been able to collect. Uh, all of these documents are available at the ESPD website, and uh, I would like to let you know that ESPD plans to uh, keep this project running in a way that we want to ensure the sustainability of what we have created. So ESPD will be creating a dedicated page on its knowledge hub where we will be collecting all the materials from this project and also other uh, interesting uh, documents that we have been able to gather throughout the project uh, produced by different organizations. Um, so that's the CORES project. Thank you so much. And uh, if there's any question, I'm happy to answer. Otherwise, I let you the floor with uh, panel one. Uh, 
Um, okay, thank you, Miguel. Um, as Miguel already said, um, we have collected you throughout the process, uh, throughout the project, a number of promising practices. And um, I'm really happy that today we can now um, look at these practices and have some good examples here from all over Europe. Um, my name is Enrique Schaum. I work with the Zentrum für Sozialwirtschaft, <laughs> Center for Social Economy uh, in Austria. And we focus on um, research and consulting um, in the sector of the social economy and labor market with, for people with disabilities. Um, so this first panel will give us now the opportunity to dive into the practices. We will start with Valentina Camini, um, which works with the European Association for Innovation in Local Development. And you are an expert in the field, so I'm really happy to hear from you. And you will give us the broader picture of good practices and socially responsible public procurement. Um, afterwards, we will have Alexandra Barbier uh, from the region of Valonia, um, a region that is also really active in uh, socially responsible public procurement and have some good examples how on local level you can um, put forward socially responsible public procurement. Then uh, Michael uh, Longino from Austria will um, tell us how as an enterprise you can promote um, employment for people dis with disabilities and also their experiences maybe with public procurement a little bit. And then last but not least, Olivier Wendling um, from, from Relais du Deux um, in France, um, which is a cooperative society of collective interest um, that gives guidance and supports public um, buyers um, in actually applying socially responsible public procurement will give us examples from France. So thank you very much. With, without further ado, please. Uh, so thank you very much for the invitation. Yes, uh, I will uh, today will present you the work that uh, we've been doing in the last six years on behalf of the European Commission. Um, I will uh, uh, what we have been uh, carrying out on behalf of the European Commission is uh, um, several. Uh, projects in which we had to identify and develop uh, good practice cases on uh, socially responsible public procurement or on a sustainable procurement so by combining the green and the social aspects and uh, this some of these projects also involved or involve because some are still uh, running um, capacity building and training so the first one that I would like to illustrate, and from here we will, uh, I will also uh, draw some uh, key findings uh, and um, some uh, input for uh, future development. Uh, the first project I would like to uh, present is uh, this, that I, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with because uh, it dates uh, some years ago, but it is still uh, very relevant. And I would like to also inform you that uh, this publication is, has been uh, translated in all EU languages, which was not the case. So it's something that uh, uh, you will uh, receive the slides. And if you uh, click on the link, you find the link to all uh, the linguistic uh, translations. Um, so we had to, uh, well, we, de we developed 71 cases and they are from uh, 22 member states and five third countries. And out of uh, 71 and 25 concern uh, persons with disabilities. So it's a, it's a high number. So this uh, research already, uh, this data already tells you that public procurement is used uh, to improve uh, opportunities, employment opportunities for persons with disabilities, and more than other groups. Uh, the good practices that we have found in which uh, uh, persons with disabilities were one of the uh, users are from Austria, Belgium, Bulgaria, Greece, Spain, France, uh, Malta, Italy, Lithuania, Netherlands, and Poland. So it's uh, widespread. And there is also one case from uh, the European Commission. Uh, the sectors in which uh, we have uh, found uh, opportunities for uh, employment opportunities for persons with disability through tendering 
uh, cleaning services, uh, road construction, food uh, and catering services, maintenance of green spaces, reuse, uh, waste collection and management, transport, social services, and web design. Um, six of uh, these case studies from uh, the 22 uh, are, uh, uh, well, regard the policies and strategies um, on socially responsible public procurement, but that also um, regard the persons with disabilities. And uh, out of these 22 uh, case studies, 13 use uh, the provision of uh, reserve contracts, uh, six of division into lots, six of uh, contract uh, award criteria, and seven of uh, contract performance clauses. So you can see that uh, reservations are a very important and powerful tool uh, for the inclusion of persons with disabilities in the labor market through procurement. Um, the other provisions give the possibility, but they are less used. Mm -hmm. So there is even a potential there to expand more and to increase the capacity of uh, public buyers to uh, to design tenders that are um, that are favorable for to the integration of uh, persons with disabilities. General findings. Um, we received uh, several questions now uh, to prepare this presentation, and I must be honest that most of them. I really do not have information. I'm not able to respond. It's very difficult to find information exposed from uh, public buyers about uh, quantitative and qualitative data. So if you ask them, okay, but how many people were employed you know, through, they don't know. Uh, what kind of target groups? Well, sometimes they know, sometimes they, they, they do not know. Um, and this uh, is already a key finding and uh, really a clear weakness uh, now of the system that we do not have uh, uh, systems in place to monitor uh, the implementation of social clauses and then to collect data uh, in, a, in an aggregate way. So now the commission is very aware of this and this will be an essential uh, point to be uh, taken into consideration in the future developments of uh, procurement policies. So um, it's uh, very difficult to know also the type of disability, for example, or uh, also to gather information on uh, the quality of the jobs, uh, what happens at the end of the contract, uh, and also what are the concrete positive social impact for the beneficiaries. This in general, eh? uh, but um, as we are talking now, persons with disability, of course, it regards uh, them as well. Um, public procurement is used more as a, for the inclusion and uh, provision of uh, employment opportunities uh, to persons with disabilities rather than uh, compared to uh, other disadvantaged people on the labor market. Um, another, let's say, group, even if I don't like this term, that uh, benefits a lot from um, uh, SRPP are uh, unemployed people, long-term unemployed, or uh, young people entering the labor market. But it is, for example, much less used uh, for migrants or homeless people. Mm? And it's also almost impossible to find data. Uh, Tom, uh, uh, earlier we were uh, talking about uh, women with, uh, with uh, disabilities, no? Intersectionality, it's, ex I mean, no one knows. Hmm? And uh, also the, the gender aspect, really knowing um, how many women and men, I mean, which is really basic nowadays, it's difficult to get this data. But why? Because uh, most of the uh, contracting authorities do not monitor what happens with these social clauses. No, they monitor other aspects of the contract, but not, but not the social clauses. And this is due to too many reasons. Also, in many cases, they do not have the capacity hmm? in terms of staff, in terms of uh, tools, uh, systems in, in place. Um, then. Um, 
you know that the directive has another provision, which is Article 42 on technical specifications, which is very relevant for persons with disabilities. It's not about the employment opportunities, it's about accessibility. And in um, our work in the last six years, we have found very few cases focusing on this. So there is a potential that is not exploited. I would focus a, lot, uh, a bit on a reserve contract because, uh, as I mentioned, this is uh, one provision, one tool of the directive that is used a lot. Um, in Europe, you can find it is implemented in different ways, depending on what is uh, um, what exists in the member state, and I will uh, explain. Uh, reserve contracts were present in uh, some national legislation, so in France, in France and in Italy, before the adoption of the directive, even before uh, the directive of 2004. But they are based on two very different models. In France, it is based on the model of atelier protégé, so shelter workshops for persons with disabilities, where you need to have at least 50% of uh, employees uh, um, with disabilities. In Italy, uh, there is a different model. Uh, shelter workshops do not exist, and you have the model of social cooperatives of type B, which are the ones that employ, must employ at least 30% or of persons with disabilities, or um, it's really defined by the law, the categories that uh, can be employed by this type of cooperatives. Um, and you can see that uh, it is implemented in a different way across the member states. Even the transposition of this article in some national law differs because um, in some countries, France is one, uh, in the transposition, they used the old model. So the old provision of, uh, of the directive, um, meaning that it is mainly shorter workshops and you need to have 50% of persons with disabilities. Um, and uh, there are also other examples, no? Uh, it's used a lot in France, for example, in Germany for shelter workshop, as I just said, or a work integration social enterprises for the inclusion of persons with disabilities and less for other groups. Uh, in uh, Sweden and in uh, Denmark, for example, they prefer using employment clauses rather than reservations. So there is a really variety in, in Europe on how these provisions are implemented that are really based on uh, the practice and, uh, of course, also the laws in the countries. In uh, um, countries of uh, a certain um, um, Central Eastern Europe and in Ireland, reservations are very little used. Um, in, some, in Ireland, it's uh, taken up. One of the reasons is also that in some countries, there is uh, the lack of legislation on social enterprises, social economy. No? So for example, the article on uh, reserve contracts, there are difficulties in the application because uh, a legal framework is lacking. Um, in general, the threshold that has been put now for a reserve contract is too high. Is too high. It's true that uh, um, in many many countries are using reserve controls also below the thresholds in their own uh, national legislation, but it's not the same. And uh, if the directive is reopened, a recommendation is really to decrease the uh, the threshold. Uh, there is also a lack of definition of disadvantaged person. Okay, this is not really for um, for persons with disabilities, but it's an important point. And also the reservation uh, uh, for three years and, um, is a bit uh, too short. This is more for uh, social services. Um, another important point could be to ask the commission to give uh, clear guidance on when when a grant can be used and when public procurement has to be used because there is still uh, not a lot of clarity on this. 
Okay, I will give you one example. Uh, and this is the from Bulgaria, because I know that one of uh, the, mem the partners are uh, of the project from Bulgaria. Um, so Article 12 of the B Bulgarian Public Procurement Act has defined a list of more than uh, 100 goods and services to be awarded, and this is the novelty, in a mandatory way um, by means of reserve contracts to, let's say, certain types of um, um, work integration social enterprises. Uh, it's the only example, to my knowledge, where, um, as you know, reservations uh, was not a, a mandatory article in the transposition. And uh, it's the only example for the moment where uh, I've seen that national legislation requires in a mandatory way to uh, use uh, reserve contracts for, I mean, 100, <laughs> a list of 100 uh, goods and services is really very wide. No, So this is a very good example. Um, and the list of uh, goods and services has been developed by using a participatory approach and uh, by really including uh, rep representatives of persons with uh, disabilities. And recently, from some work we have been done, um, I, until, I mean, in the period from 2020-2023, the number, number of public procurement procedures with reserve contracts is uh, more than 1,200. Um, so they use a lot of reserve contracts. The rest of the provisions are used very, very little. <laughs> Now I would like to tell you really a few words about uh, uh, some projects that we are carrying out on behalf of the European Commission. Uh, one is, uh, well, uh, the acronym is uh, We Buy Social EU. Uh, this is a big service contract we are organizing and uh, it has two main tasks. Uh, one task is uh, to organize training and uh, awareness raising in 12 member states. Uh, Austria, Belgium, Bulgaria, Cyprus, Estonia, uh, Spain, Finland, Lithuania, Luxembourg, Malta, Portugal, and Slovenia. And uh, the, uh, the targets are uh, public uh, buyers, so public um, procurers, but also civil servants from uh, public administration in charge of policies in the field of, I mean, a social field, a social economy, employment. Uh, but 30% is for uh, representatives of uh, social economy entities. And as I know that there are many uh, representatives also from uh, European uh, umbrella organizations, this can be relevant for uh, your members. Uh, the second task is to organize a communications and awareness raising campaign here covering the whole Europe, so the 27 member states, uh, to increase uh, awareness about the potential of SRPP, uh, but also to inform uh, social economy entities about uh, the possibilities offered by the directive, and maybe also to access new markets, mm? not only the usual, uh, um, the usual uh, sectors that I mentioned earlier. Uh, this communication campaign will be done uh, through social media mainly, uh, but uh, we are uh, going to, we are developing uh, videos, eight videos, uh, and we hope that this will uh, inspire. Uh, here you can find some uh, dates. Uh, so 23rd of May, Lithuania, 24th uh, Belgium, Brussels in, Fra in French, and the 5th of June will be in, uh, uh, in Dutch, uh, Portugal and Estonia on the 4th of June. Uh, in September, we will have in Barcelona, the date is to be fixed. And on the 2nd of October in Madrid, the 23rd of September in Finland. And if you are interested, you can contact us. Uh, another service contract that is going on is the Green Public Procurement Help Desk. Uh, despite the, the title, it focuses also on social aspects. 
this uh, the, the diesel flask exists for uh, more than uh, 10 years but in the last three years it has been expanded the scope from green to sustainable procurement so combination of green and social aspects here you can find uh, all the uh, the links uh, it's basically a collection of good practices that we do and you find them. It's not a publication like this one, but you find the, um, everything on the website and they are channeled through a newsletter. We have uh, eight newsletter per, um, per year. And uh, stakeholder resources is a service where stakeholders can send their questions in English, French and Germany on procurement. Mm -hmm. And I put the link to an interesting case study on accessibility from Sweden. Thank you very much. Thank you, Valentina. Um, are there any questions from the audience at this point? Because we have a few minutes to dedicate it to questions. Yes, Tom. Hi, Valentina. Um, you work a lot with the commission on, on this topic. Um, part of it, the solution is, of course, capacity building and so forth. Um, another part is more political pressure. Um, do you know if the Commission are planning anything to put more political pressure or to work more on that side of things? Well, I know that there is a strong lobbying from stakeholders to reopen the directive, but uh, I do not uh, think... Uh, this will happen before uh, the, I mean, before the end of the mandate. But it's good that there are discussions now, uh, which uh, it will be also your task to uh, to uh, continue. Uh, I mean, with the new commission and parliament. At the same time, I really would like to warn you that uh, this directive is not perfect, but it's good. And because it's such a complex matter and also very sensitive, not to uh, base uh, uh, your advocacy activities only on reopening the directive, because capacity building is essential. It's essential because uh, you need to have both, and it has to be regular, done on a regular basis, because people change, et cetera. Um, and also, raise awareness is a permanent job uh, because unfortunately uh, it's disappointing to see that very often all this is uh, politicized no and when there is a, a change uh, in uh, in the color of the government it's forgotten no and this should not be the case uh, i mean the use of a uh, of procurement to achieve a social environmental uh, innovation goals should be, it's a means and should not depend on uh, who is uh, governing. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, it's really important to continue raising awareness. Um, there are, um, I don't know, there are uh, maybe some clarifications to be provided by the commission no, on uh, some aspects. Uh, but then it's really capacity building, training, raising awareness, ex exchanges good practices. So also from uh, your side, if you have uh, good practices, please share with the commission uh, because um, it's a way to build capacity. It's also a way, especially when uh, the, let's say, the political uh, will is not there to show that uh, other countries are doing, other cities are doing it, they are achieving good results, no? It's really a good way to convince people. And especially those that are still very uh, reluctant by um, putting forward a lot of arguments about uh, um, legal insecurity. Legal insecurity is there for very, very specific aspects but not for all the social provisions. Mm. So, but still uh, many public authorities do not feel uh, the, do not feel uh, the confidence to, to use it. 
there are also legal challenges going on, especially uh, before administrative courts, uh, especially when it comes to reserve contracts. And this is, of course, dissuading the contracting authorities, no? So in the framework of this, uh, this project, we are going to devote some sessions to really clarify the jurisprudence, what is possible and what is not. Thank you. Especially, I think the last point is really important because like yesterday, for example, we talked about how local authorities have sometimes issues because they're, there's a lot of fear to have contracts and then tenders that are then later um, uh, fought against. So, and then they have, there's a lot of risk involved. So thank you very much for this point. And also the training was a huge point yesterday. So, yeah, thank you. Um, I would like now to hand over to you um, to tell us a bit about how Valonia is handling the issue. Oh, yeah, sorry, of course. So uh, I'm going to introduce you the network uh, of uh, social close facilitators uh, in public uh, works contract in uh, Wallonia. So uh, Wallonia is a French speaking uh, region in Belgium uh, with a population of more than uh, 3.5 uh, million people. It's a region uh, marked by unemployment and uh, a need to optimize uh, public spending through public works contracts uh, has been noted. So in uh, 2012, uh, the network of social close facilitators uh, was set up. Uh, the facilitators representing uh, the public and the private sector uh, uh, helps public procurement stakeholders in uh, integration and uh, implementation of uh, social clauses. In addition, in uh, 2017, uh, the Walloon uh, government imposed uh, the obligation uh, to integrate social clauses in construction works contracts uh, with a value above uh, 1 million uh, euros. And uh, in 2017, uh, the government imposed the insertion of social clauses for roads and equipment contracts with a value um, of uh, more than uh, 750,000 uh, euros. Below these values, uh, the contracting authority remains free to insert uh, social clauses in their contracts. So the social clauses uh, as a great objective, uh, which is the training of uh, job seekers and learners and uh, the integration of uh, people with uh, disabilities. Um, Wallonia defined two types of uh, social clauses uh, to be included in a contract performance uh, condition. So the training clause, uh, which is the obligation for the contractor uh, to train job seekers or apprentices uh, during the, the, the execution of the contract for a number of hours defined uh, in the tender documents. And the flexible clause, which is uh, the obligation for the contractor either to train uh, job seekers or to subcontract uh, to a work integration social enterprise a percentage uh, of the contract value. At the core of the process, uh, there are the social close facilitators, which uh, helps uh, in the inclusion and uh, the implementation of social clauses. So first, uh, the contracting authority uh, contacts uh, its facilitator um, for help uh, in including a social clause in the work contract. Then the facilitators of the public sector calibrate uh, the social clause depending on the type of work, uh, duration and value uh, of the contract. And um, they help uh, to incorporate it in the, in the contract. And later uh, the facilitators of the private sector uh, is informed of the successful uh, tender and uh, they assist uh, the company in uh, implementing the social clauses. So all along the process, the data is written in an uh, internal software uh, for tracking and uh, for monitoring objectives. Uh, as you can as uh, you can see in the table, there has been a constant uh, increase in the number and value of uh, work contracts that include a social clause. 
So the figures uh, you see are the cumulative indicators since uh, 2016. In 2022, uh, 100 uh, to uh, 1,200 public procurements for works, uh, including a social clause, out of which uh, 570 and not 400, 570 were awarded, which means in progress or uh, completed. Um, in uh, 2022, a total of uh, 965 learners have been trained uh, on uh, public work sites thanks uh, to social clauses, and the social clauses uh, also increase the use of social uh, economy enterprise. Uh, 163 uh, contracts were subcontracted uh, to a social uh, economy uh, enterprise. Uh, now on uh, social impacts, uh, in Wallonia, uh, the unemployment uh, has decreased in uh, recent years. Uh, the social clauses in a public works contract has brought different benefits. Uh, firstly, uh, social clauses make it possible uh, to fight shortages in the construction sector. Uh, the use of social clauses uh, in, the in the execution of works contracts make it possible to recruit trainees and uh, workers from uh, disadvantaged uh, groups. And uh, then social clauses also maximize collaborations between traditional businesses and social economy uh, enterprises. The following success factors uh, can be identified. So from the start, Wallonia has set up a dynamic partnership uh, between the various public and uh, private uh, stakeholders. Uh, the region has also uh, decided to run the network uh, itself and not to uh, outsource it. The use of social clauses has become simpler and more uh, accepted uh, by public buyers, traditional companies, and social economy enterprises, uh, thanks to the uh, facilitator's work. And the private sector participates uh, in the network and brings up the questions and uh, difficulties uh, to the pro uh, of the professional sector. Uh, which are always listened to and uh, analyzed uh, by the network. And uh, now on a recommendation, uh, first of all, uh, design a policy strategy and a legal framework for the use of social clauses. Uh, then uh, set up a social clause uh, facilitators network in charge of developing the integration of social clauses in public contracts and make uh, the network operate uh, with uh, a partnership involving operators from the public and uh, the private sector. And it's also important to ensure that the network uh, exchange uh, information frequently. Uh, in Wallonia, the network meets every month to discuss uh, any difficulties uh, in order to um, resolve them in a flexible way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? at the moment yes please yeah thank, thank you alexandra matthias moro social services europe um already impressive data statistics also that you uh, take the data as they are produced and then can analyze them um now you focused which is also your your mission no on works and roads and construction contracts is there something happening beyond other fields or are you really limited to this or could you also in your capacity say in your network meetings we also now look into other sectors or is it only there where there is the obligation uh, legally set by by Valunia? yes the network is focused on uh, works public contract there is for now Non network for the other public procurement, uh, but uh, we know there is a, a need to to build something uh, like that uh, for the other public procurement. But for now, it's uh, only for a, a public works contract. I wanted to ask who is.
Japanese or is it the the so the It's actually Wallonia uh, who finance uh, the network. So we work with private sector and uh, we have some subventions uh, for them. Uh, so it's uh, the region of Wallonia who finance uh, this. Um, very impressive. Um, it sounds simple in some ways now that it's been decided and set up and so forth, but can you tell us a bit about the discussions like why are you funding it and what led you to, to be convinced that it's a good idea to fund it and how can we advise other regions to do that? So a bit more detail in terms of like, not just now that it's set up, how is it going, but what were the steps that led to its creation and, and what convinced you to, to finance such a such an operation? Uh, actually, the network exists since 10 years, but I'm working for uh, Wallonia since six months. So <laughs> I, I'm not here from the beginning. I cannot tell you, but I can uh, uh, ask to my uh, colleagues uh, the, the beginning of the process. There is a, we developed a case study on this in the GPPL desk. So, and... Uh, there is a bit of history there. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, perfect. Then Michael, please. Um... Yeah, hello. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh... Yes, I'm uh, happy to be here today and uh, and I'm happy that I can tell you something of uh, what we are doing in Gleisdorf in the region which was already mentioned uh, today uh, in the south southern eastern part of Austria. Uh, I'm coming from a social service provider uh, called Jean B. And uh, one of our, let's say, services, but it's not a service, it's a company, is our company House Masters, which is in terms sometimes difficult to describe, but let's say it's a social business, what we are running uh, in our region. Um, just a few words about uh, what is Chance B. Uh, we are, as I said, a social service uh, provider in the region uh, which offers uh, 33 different services in our region. Uh, we um, have, a, let's say, a mission that if somebody is needing a service uh, in a rural region like our region, uh, we are there to deliver that service. So it uh, can start uh, from the very beginning in life. Uh, if uh, a baby is born and there is maybe a disability taking place, we support the families uh, with mobile services to go to the family and help them uh, finding a way to dealing with the situation. Uh, and then children grow older, they go to school, we help them, support them uh, in uh, going to regular mainstream schools. Then after school life, uh, there is a very important phase in life uh, which is employment and uh, in that uh, time we help youngsters uh, to find their way through all the, all the, the options they have uh, to find a decent uh, perspective uh, for their uh, next steps in the employment uh, phase and uh, also we uh, help and guide uh, persons who are looking for a job who are long-term unemployed uh, and help them also find uh, jobs on the first labor market and this is where the challenge started, starts uh, because, as we already heard today, there are a lot of persons with disabilities looking for work and cannot find uh, a job, a full legal contract. Or which what we saw in the region is that they find a job for uh, a short period of time and due to several reasons, they drop out of the first labor market. They go back to, to the security services, to financial support from the state. Uh, and we offer them services to help them finding a new job, but the story goes on and on, and they uh, again fall out of the of the first labor market, come back to our services. And this was one of the initial ideas of founding our social business, where we offer 
persons with disabilities and other disadvantaged groups permanent uh, uh, jobs uh, fully with contracts, with full contracts that they can stay in our company and contribute uh, with their workforce to the aims of our company, but also have a place where they can stay and where they do not have to move out of the company after a short period of time, which is very typical for Austria, that you get a, a job which supports you but after uh, uh, let's say three months six months nine months you have to leave the company find a job on the first labor market not for all of our uh, persons in our region this was an option that's why uh, the company housemasters was founded uh, let's say 20 years ago uh, Yes, what is uh, Jean Spie all together? We are a private nonprofit uh, organization of the social economy. So this is, I think, very important in the terms we're discussing today. I think it is uh, very important that we have uh, social enterprises, uh, uh, social businesses uh, who are uh, non-profit orientated. Um, yes, we uh, have a lot of different uh, uh, public uh, authorities who finance our services. So let's say we know the world of uh, public authorities very well, <laughs> uh, and we can understand also the limitations and sometimes also the fears we heard it today that uh, if you go into a procurement process and you have maybe this damocles sword above you am i doing the things right or not uh, we totally can understand that, that this can be a barrier uh, and uh, yes we 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 try to have a holistic perspective perspective on the world of uh, on the world of uh, social services uh, because we are offering our services in field of employment when later in times of retirement we help people living independently at home uh, when they get older so also we are into the business of care services and uh, medical support and also we take uh, we think about leisure activities uh, of persons who need support in participating fully in social life and in social activities uh, and I think this is something which is very uh, unique in, in Austria, this very broad perspective uh, on the cross-sectoral, let's say, activities. And we are now doing this uh, for 30, uh, 35 years. So we have an anniversary this year. <laughs> uh -huh. What is also important, uh, we are uh, trying to uh, develop innovative uh, approaches and projects to further develop our services and also to show with our innovative projects uh, that uh, there is other ways we can think about social services, that we can further develop uh, social services. And uh, Jean Spie is also very active in, uh, uh, in a political way. We are not uh, from... Uh, specific party uh, but uh, we try to to give input that the frameworks for social services on on regional level on national level but also on european level can further uh, develop uh, when it comes concrete to our uh, social enterprise or to our social business house masters uh, yes, we talked about uh, what are, so, let's say, the typical ways of what we are doing, the construction business, or uh, and we are in this, in that sense, very typical. Uh, <laughs> so we are doing uh, we are doing facility management services. Uh, we uh, we are, have a big cleaning uh, business. We're doing gardening uh, and uh, winter road clearance. Uh, but also we we run uh, a market uh, where we uh, sell uh, cheap products uh, for uh, people maybe who, who who need them and to have access to 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 cheap food and to to help uh, that the food is not wasted. Uh, so it is a quite a broad uh, business approach, uh, and at the moment we are doing it with uh, seventy five employees in total. Uh, and 50 uh, persons in our company uh, have disadvantages. And from that 50, 33 persons are persons with disabilities in the perspective of the Austrian law. So this we have to uh, have some, some uh, let's say, diploma. No. <laughs> no, just, okay. Uh, anyway, uh, but uh, when we are doing this business, and I think this is also important perspective when we talk about uh, the framework of, of public procurement, uh, we have to think of that if we 
push the public procurement towards more uh, social aspects, uh, we also have to have uh, the companies who are running that uh, that uh, business afterwards. And these companies need uh, frameworks and 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 uh, good uh, conditions that they can work with uh, disadvantaged persons. And unfortunately, at the moment in Austria, I think there is a lot of uh, development who needs to take place that we that we can have more uh, social businesses like our uh, company Housemasters, because we are do not getting any uh, additional structural support for running our business. Uh, we get uh, the subsidies for the persons with disabilities working in our company, like every other uh, company, which is in a way good. So in that sense we are a very inclusive company we are not a sheltered workshop or something like this but it is very difficult to get the job done uh, to survive in a competitive uh, field when you think of uh, the cleaning for example uh, we have uh, companies uh, who look at their workforce and i was talking to a company leader of a cleaning business uh, a few years ago and i was asking him how many people do you employ and uh, and she said 20 and i said oh but but you are a real big business you have around they're doing cleaning everywhere and she said yeah yeah now we, we we are a team of 20 running the company and we have 800 who are working for us <laughs> so i think this is an example uh where we say we have a totally different approach uh in how people should live and work in our company we want to offer decent jobs we want to offer fully paid salaries but not uh, exploiting people and giving them good conditions in work and also we're working with people who need support in daily uh, when when doing their important job for us uh we we are not stopping in making reasonable reasonable accommodation in the company or restructuring the workflows to adapt to the individual needs which is also very important but we also take care also of the private life of our workforce uh, when they get in financial troubles or they get problems with drug addiction or they need medical support because of uh, uh, depressive situations that are taking place, we try to support and help them that they are not falling out of the business and falling out of the workforce. And this needs uh, staff and time and resources. And in a competitive business area, it's very difficult uh, to, to get the job done and to, to, to finance that additional resources we need uh, for making our job. Yes, uh, that's why we are very happy that here in the room we also have friends from the city of Kleistorf <laughs> where we uh, have a cooperation uh, where the city of Kleistorf is supporting our social business in uh, giving us uh, uh, jobs to do in the city and uh, what we are doing for the city of Kleistorf at the moment is we are cleaning the local schools. Uh, we are gardening public spaces, also in cooperation with others from the city of Kleistorf who are doing that uh, job. And uh, also part of the winter, winter road clearance is our job. And of course, uh, uh, it is also very important for us to have trustful business relations uh, with uh, our customers so that we uh, do not have to find always new jobs to do and always invest into uh, acquisition of new jobs uh, because we need our resources for something else. That's why it's very good to have a trustful partner like the city of Geistorf, where we know we have something to do for them. We're working together. We, we have a, a fixed, let's say, job. Uh, and we have a perspective for more than on more than a year, not only working for three months and then having to find another job for us to do. But as you can see, altogether 10% of our annual turnover comes from uh, public entities at the moment. So there is still, let's say, uh, air left to breathe. <laughs> we can further improve uh, the cooperation uh, with with public entities. And I think that's why this project is so important for us, that uh, when we get the chance to, to be part of, of uh, procurement processes, uh, uh, and we can get uh, a good a good deal out of it, we would be very happy. 
but one maybe critical remark at, at the end uh, uh, we we had a, 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 a experience in making a procurement process not with the city of Gleisdorf because there it's working very well but uh, for a cleaning job uh, from a federal uh, building in Austria and we we there was uh, 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 the, the social aspect in the in the procurement, and we we got the the uh, we, we won the process, but we never started to work the job because when we won it, uh, the uh, the authority said, "But your offer was too high, the money you wanted uh, for the job done compared to the others who did uh, uh, the the other cleaning companies who who gave some offers to you, and then they said uh, there was a a, a, a kick out scenario in the process of the public procurement, and they said if the the the, the offer is let's say ten percent or fifteen percent higher than the lowest one, then you get kicked out, and that's why we got kicked out. <laughs> so I think this is also what we have to think of, even when we do uh, the, the social procurement processes and we, we motivate public authorities to do it, we also have to think into detail how can, let's say, WISE or social businesses or enterprises get the right, uh, uh, let's say, conditions that they can do the job they have to do, otherwise uh, we will not find uh, the social companies who is then who will then do the job. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Um, are there any questions to, for Michael from the audience? Yes, thank, thank you for the floor and thank you for presenting this very interesting and inspiring project. <laughs> uh, I really like the word housemasters. <laughs> Uh, my question would be because as I'm not um, a legal advisor, um, but uh, as far as I understand, it's often it's very difficult to uh, add uh, social or environmental aspects to public procurement. Uh, has have the project been challenged legally in some way? Was it a problem or? Uh, was it just just no problem? Because I have been told that uh, you have to fulfill some criteria and it's very complicated and everything. Yes. Uh, yes, it it was a big challenge for us uh, to 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 be part of that procurement process, and we were in a lucky position because we professionalized our business in the last uh, years, and uh, so we had a lot, we have at the moment a lot of very qualified staff in place uh, who also have that, let's say, formal qualifications you need in a procurement process to provide that you can do the job and get the job done. Uh, I know from other social enterprises prices in our region we were the only one who were going to for the tender uh, because others were kicked out because they could not have that formal criteria uh, done to be part of the process uh, which is also another aspect uh, you have to take into consideration in the procedures that we are competing sometimes with, let's say, uh, the big companies, the international ones with a lot of uh, uh, other opportunities than, let's say, may maybe small initiatives, small so social enterprises. And this is also we have to take into consideration. And maybe also it needs not only support uh, and, and training uh, for the municipalities and for the legal uh, legal bodies, but also for the for the for the social enterprises themselves to get uh, the tender done <laughs> and to get that. Uh, yes, but we could manage, fortunately. But it's encouraging. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's so inspiring to hear that a not-for-profit organization like yours can engage in tenders, which is very encouraging to hear. Just to follow up with her question, you answered that you do have like qualified staff who can navigate the complexities, but how do you now get the money to be able to pay for that for those qualified staff and still be able to compete against for-profit organizations, for instance? Thank you. 
Uh, yeah, to be honest, <laughs> that's quite hard to do. Uh, uh, but I think that uh, I was discussing before I came here with the boss of that company. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm I'm the general manager of uh, Chance B. Uh, so I have the uh, uh, I have always in mind all our 33 different services. But before I came here, I talked to the boss of uh, of our, our company Housemasters, uh, and he said to me, "If you go there uh, and tell." about our company you have to think that uh, a lot of what is going on and is working is because we have very very motivated persons working in the company uh, who earn not that much as they would earn in other uh, companies on the first labor market they they work let's say pro bono uh, to 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 let's say fix things which maybe uh, yes happen in daily business so there and and think if 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 that generation let's say of let's our founders generation the, uh, who were very motivated if they are let's say dying out and they are not working anymore it will be very difficult so this is one factor and the other factor is uh we are quite a big uh company as Sean's be all together uh, and the 75 employees of uh, the company Housemasters, they can benefit uh, from the whole uh, group. So uh, when it comes to terms of procurement processes, uh, we have uh, professional staff uh, in, in the whole company who are let's say able to do uh, the management of tenders of project fundings etc etc and this is the benefit of course not every other uh, uh, small social enterprise can have mm. yeah michael danke uh, very inspiring uh, presentation but I, i take up your your problem description from the end there yeah where you there is there is this issue that uh, the the lowest bit was then whatever 20 15 percent below and you were kicked out so for my very short two link questions did you know this before i mean that there is this condition of let's say this 20 or 15 or 10 percent difference or did you learn afterwards and second why couldn't you play with the house masters and all these employment uh, benefits that are there for the labor market inclusion of disadvantaged person why why was this then not taken into to consideration that this logically say increases the price but there comes a benefit with this that, that is what i don't understand ah uh, okay uh the first answer is uh no we 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 we, we saw this clause in, in the end uh the the paper was quite big <laughs> and all the the rules in it uh uh and the second thing is uh, yes uh I'll, of course i was uh, disappointed in a way that it this was not taken into consideration uh but i think this is uh the 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 let's say the the public procurement was uh a big uh, real estate company owned by the state and uh, in this uh, in this procurement process the cleaning of a lot of different entities was was done and uh, i think that still in mind there is the price is, is important it for them they said uh, okay we have to do the cleaning of our real estates and this is for schools for military services etc etc and and i think uh, even the public authorities even that they wanted to give the 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 the, the social aspect uh, the, in the end they could not get out of this logic of uh, let's say the cheapest is the best or the or we maybe there is some idea of uh, we are all paying taxes so they want to do the best out of our taxes and if they give us the job and and then it comes out that they pay us more than another to another company maybe they are afraid of getting critics that they waste our taxes and not thinking about the benefit what it would bring to to us if 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 more people have decent work I, I don't know. Sorry, just a question. Um, would it be possible that your company, uh, your organization, would be a um, subcontractor for the winning a big company uh, in, this, in this case? Like that, there is no procedure. 
And like that, the big company is achieving the social requirements of the contract. Uh, when I was when I was getting into contact with the with the uh, uh, project, uh, this is one of the findings. I was very impressed that in other countries maybe it is possible. And also, I like the Wallonian uh, example that with this subcontracting we get, uh, let's say, a bit of the of the cake without having too much troubles with it. Uh, and I really like that aspect. And I think one of the Jean's B ideas from the very beginning was uh, getting into cooperation with others. So I would be very open for that. On the other hand, I see at the moment the, the, the attitude of the companies we are working uh, in the competitive field. I think we sh it would be a, quite a way because there is a total different attitude towards doing business than we have but it would be an interesting process maybe we can learn from each other and it would be very interesting to do that yes thank you sorry <laughs> olivier <laughs> now it's your turn for um the, your examples and maybe also you can tell us a bit about um how strasbourg is using public procurement and how you tackle some of the problems that we now heard. Thank you very much. So my name is uh, Olivier Wendling. Um, my name uh, sounds German, but I don't speak German. And my English is a bit rusty. So just be kind with me. Uh, I represent the, um, the cooperative Relais 2D, which is based in Strasbourg. Um, we are active in the field of uh, social clauses uh, since uh, more than 20 years. So it's something very classic uh, for us. Um, and we are uh, basically uh, assisting the, the all the public authorities, the local authorities that are under the the code of uh, common public which is the uh, code of uh, public uh, procurement uh, in our uh, in our um, local area uh, so we 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 work a lot with uh, the municipality of strasbourg the metropole of strasbourg the region of alsace uh, a lot of um, of uh, social uh, housing uh, landlords and a lot of uh, uh, public authorities depending from the states, basically. Um, what we do every day is that we assist the public buyers in, intro in introducing uh, public, um, uh, so sorry, social um, consideration in their uh, procurement. Uh, then when it's written in the contract, uh, we have a team of um, kind of social workers that are helping the companies that won the contract to achieve the social requirements. And uh, these, uh, these, uh, these colleagues, they, they, um, they help uh, people every day. They have uh, interviews with uh, these, these, these people um, to, to enter into the companies that have these uh, obligations. Uh, so you can see some figures about uh, what it represents each each year. Each, um, each year, uh, we are one of the city, one of the um, the, the metropole that is uh, making uh, a lot of uh, hours of uh, insertion in France. But uh, there are other ones like uh, Nantes Metropole, Paris, uh, Lyon, and so on. Uh, so our Basic activity is about social clauses, but since two years, we are offering new services on the field of uh, environmental uh, and circular economy uh, clauses in public procurement. And this is very interesting because you will see uh, it, uh, it is um, something in very interesting for the future of the uh, sustainable uh, procurement uh, widely. Just a word about the context in France. Uh, we have a strong support from the from the states. Uh, 
there is a, a national plan, which is the National Plan for Public Procurement, the PNAD. Um, and there is two main goals in this plan. 30% uh, of the public uh, contract must include a social clause and 100% of the public uh, contract must include environmental clauses. And it's until uh, 2026. So to help the public buyers to achieve this, uh, these uh, objectives, uh, there are some tools. Um, I could mention RAPID, which is a kind of a forum between uh, public buyers. They can share their publications and their uh, contracts uh, to, to share the good practices, in fact. Uh, Le Marché de l'Inclusion, which is a um, kind of a marketplace uh, online where you could find every um, social companies and companies of the field of uh, uh, disability. And there is a very recent uh, change. Uh, Pôle emploi, which is the public service for the for uh, unemployment, um, is now France Travail. There is a change in the in the terminology you can see, and um, it has uh, some influences on the the field of uh, disability because uh, one of the the goal is that the people with disability um, can uh, can go to the, um, the first uh, labor sector, like uh, uh, everyone. So the, the main goal of the um, social clauses is to help people to enter into the classic companies, into the, the, the companies that are doing the construction, that are doing the public works. But in Strasbourg, we we have uh, social clauses in every kind of um, public procurement, even in in the field of the the um, engineering in engineering uh, before the the construction, for example. Um, so we help the people to find job in the in the in, in the companies. Uh, the people we helped are. For example, the people uh, unemployed since a long time, uh, the people with no diplomas or no professional experiences. We have a lot of people from abroad, the, the people, uh, migrants and so on. Uh, a lot of people that have very difficulties um, in, uh, in French, for example. Uh, but we also have uh, people with uh, disability. And after the conference in Gleisdorf, uh, uh, I spoke a lot with my colleagues about how we can increase uh, the number of people with disability to enter the, the companies. And it appears that it's kind of a subject because in France, um, I guess there is a, a lack of, um, of uh, culture for the classic company, especially in the construction and uh, works, uh, public works sector to, to, to give their chance to people with disabilities. And the only examples they, my colleagues can uh, give to me is about companies that are uh, um, acculturate to this uh, subject and that, has, uh, that have, sorry, in, in, in their teams, people that are specialized in, in the question of handicap. And these companies, they have a label uh, to show that they are active uh, in the, the integration of people with disability. And the other example my colleagues told me was about um, uh, a few people that, that have um, uh, disabilities, but they don't tell to the employers that they have these disabilities. So the employer don't know. Okay. Um, just, uh, yes. I, I would like to mention this girl, um, uh, she's, uh, her name is uh, Ruveda, and she was um, employed by a big uh, construction company uh, to, to be the one that is in link with all the, um, the, the people living in the building that is uh, under construction. And 
one of our uh, goal in Strasbourg is to uh, give more chance to the, the girls, even in the construction sector, and there is a lot to do uh, in this field. Well, it was the, the classic uh, situation where there is, a, there is a, um, a condition in the contract, the, 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 the companies that uh, win the contract, they have to uh, reserve a certain amount of hours for the people with uh, 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 in weak position in the labor market. If we have a look to the, the criterion, which is kind of a strong tool in my opinion, this is the very basic situation in the contract, you will find this kind of table where the company has to choose how much hours of uh, employment they will give to the people in weak position. And you, you have the, the points uh, that you get even in the contract, so it's very clear for everyone. Uh, in, in public procurement, we defend the, the idea that there should be every time a criteria about sustainable development, which would be divided into the social uh, inclu um, impact and the environmental impact. And I have to say, uh, it's something that uh, is more and more uh, general uh, in our uh, uh, area. Sometimes when the, the contract is um, sued for, uh, when it's a very big contract and a long-term long contract, you can be much more, um, you can go much, much, um, you can go, uh, for, uh, you, you can go to other, um, how to say, you can ask the companies to, to engage on uh, other uh, field, like uh, you can ask them to, uh, I was to say sorry. Yes, you can ask them to 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 set uh, tools like uh, welcome leaflets, to set uh, mentoring in the company, uh, to set uh, interviews uh, about um, subject like health, accommodation, transport, and so on. Um, you can set. Uh, uh, some stuff about uh, training, development of uh, new skills, and you can put it in the criteria. But it has to be long contracts. Uh, just to focus on uh, marché réservé, which are um, very used uh, in France, uh, like every week in Strasbourg, we can set one, I, I, I could say. Uh, so the idea is very simple, uh, to bid the contract, the companies must employ at least 50 per, uh, percent, which is high, as you said, uh, to separate um, type of uh, company, one side, the company that are specialized in handicap and uh, uh, on the other side, the work integration, social enterprises, and you can reserve to one type to the other type. And since two years, you can also reserve to both type. And it's supposed to, to promote the um, kind of joint venture between the social and the adapted companies. A few example, uh, and it's very important uh, to speak about the allotment. Uh, Every day, I I I, um, I have to 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 look at uh, um, uh, call for tenders, and uh, I can identify some very classic um, activities that could uh, uh, be reserved to to uh, social and social companies. Uh, what is interesting in this uh, example is that you can notice the lot number one, which is about um, uh, reuse of the materials because it was a renovation of uh, an office. The reuse of the material. And uh, there is a lot of uh, social companies that are uh, getting more and more competencies in the field of environmental impacts of the construction at the moment. 
So in an allotment like this, I would tell to the, the public buyer to uh, reserve lot one lot nine the cleaning which is a very classic uh, activity like you can see the other activity uh, uh, cleaning uh, painting uh, uh, landscaping and so on and the other lot they will um, they will have uh, uh, hours of insertion for the people in weak position in the uh, labor market as well uh, another example uh, we worked uh, with the the authority that is in charge of the waste uh, in our region, and there is a new law in France that every local authorities has to give a solution to the 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 inhabitants uh, for the, um, uh, the the green waste is, and there is a lot of uh, needs of uh, this kind of uh, composters. And the, there, there is a reserve contract reserved to both type of uh, uh, inclusive companies. The first two ones, they are from the field of uh, uh, social, yeah, social enterprises and the two other ones are uh, working with people um, uh, disabled. And what we would love is to uh, make joint venture between the two types. But in fact, they are in competition. Yeah. And that's one of my questions. Uh, yes. I don't know why they cannot speak the one to the others and answer together. Uh, uh, another example, this one is very interesting. It's the, um, the region of Alsace. Uh, we, uh, they, they, they have to care about uh, the... the the high schools, and there are a lot in Alsace, and all the the school furniture um, are uh, in a contract. Like basically, it was a contract for furn uh, furniture of um, uh, the, the 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 school furniture. Yes, and we made a, uh, a lot of uh, discussions with the services with the buyers and with the uh, inclusive structures to identify if it's possible to set a lot, a reserved contract, about the question of repairing the school furniture instead of buying new ones. And this is possible because, once again, there is a new law in France that uh, uh, asks the buyers for some kind of goods to buy a, a, a certain quantity of uh, uh, reused materials. So this is something that is uh, very new and I'm sure it will be a good practice that we can speak about for all the other uh, public authorities we work for because this kind of furniture, you can find it in every city. So we will see, the competition is, is online. I know that there are some uh, social enterprises, organizations that are going to answer. I know that some structure of the of the disability field are going to answer. Once again, they don't want to answer together. That's sad. Uh, we will see. This this is very linked with my question just before. Uh, Sometimes when the public buyer, they don't want to go for an allotment because the contract is too big. It's most of the time for the construction of very big uh, public equipment. They can go for global contract. So you, you will have for sure one of the biggest company of the construction sector that win the, the, the tender. And we set we, we can do it just one time. Uh, we, we set a, a, a criteria about what activities the big company is okay to give to the uh, inclusive sector. And so in this example, it was once again about the reuse of material, because as you can see, when 
when the yes they they can they can identify a lot of uh, uh, stones and stuff like that that could be reused into the project. It's it is a, a construction of a high school. So there is possibility for sub subcontracting, but this is something I would love to um, to try again with the the public buyers, but they are really frightening about the legal issues, the legal uh, validity of this kind of uh, of uh, criteria. And I'm I'm sure, like in Brussels, they do this, they do this kind of. Uh, uh, criteria. So maybe we can go further on this subject. But in my opinion, it's something very interesting because, uh, as I mentioned, there is no procedure. It's only business. And for the big company, it's a way to uh, uh, achieve the, the, the social uh, uh, requirements. Just to mention another example, at the moment, we have a, a very huge factory that is built very close from Strasbourg for uh, the company Huawei. And they have a lot of uh, social work requirements in their contract with Buig, which is the winner of the tenant. Yes. Um, and we are working a lot to make it possible for the inclusive sector to be on the construction site. For the people with disabilities, for example, we are trying to to set um, uh, a food truck that would be there every day for uh, making and giving the, 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 the meal for all the workers that are on site. And this is something we have to discuss with, uh, with the, the company that won the, the tender, like Buig or big companies like that. <laughs> So what's next uh, in Strasbourg? I could mention one very interesting contract that is um, um, uh, at the moment uh, in discussion. Uh, Strasbourg uh, Metropole is uh, looking for a lot of uh, promotional items and there is a big contract about all these items. And in the items, there are some textile items. And in Strasbourg, we have one uh, social organization that is really specialized on this kind of uh, products. And if you go a bit uh, further, there, are, uh, there, there is a lot of um, um, social companies in this field. So in my opinion, what is really important is to bring the services and the buyers. We take, it, we, we take them by end and we go to the organization like that, they, they, they can see by themselves what the organization is able to do. They can touch the product. They can speak with the technicians. And I'm sure it changed a lot. This, is, this could be called uh, sourcing. But in my opinion, you, you have to go deep in the sourcing in, the, in this uh, area of uh, promoting social organization. One, one of the key points as well is that sometimes the social organization, they do not know how to answer the procurement. So if you go for a reserved market and there is no answer to the re reserved market, you won't do another one, never. So you have to be really sure that there is at least one. Of course, you must have some competition. So you have to speak a lot with the... The, the networks of the, um, the the social sector. Another example is about the, the, the stadium uh, of our local uh, football team, the Racing Club de Strasbourg. They are, um, there is a renovation of the, the stadium. And all the seats, they will be um, unscrewed. And what we are uh, trying to do is that these seats uh, they will they will become uh, some kind of uh, collector items for the supporters, for the fans of the Racing Club de Strasbourg. So we are discussing with uh, inclusive companies, organizations that are thinking about what could became this uh, this this waste in, waste in fact. 
And uh, I'm sure we will get uh, some really interesting uh, results uh, with this. And last, <laughs> I have to speak about uh, the uh, Olympics uh, in, in Paris, uh, because in Strasbourg we do a lot of uh, very nice things, but we are not the only ones. And the geos, uh, there is a, uh, um, yeah, uh, we want in France that uh, the GEOs uh, would be the first uh, sustainable uh, Olympic Games. So just to mention two companies that are from Alsace, the one that uh, made the wood structure of the pool, and another one that is building all the, um, the, the furniture. And in the contract, there was a criteria about the accessibility for people with disabilities. And that's one of the reasons why they won the contract. So uh, I have uh, two tickets for the <laughs> the water polo. I don't know nothing to the water polo, but it was the only one affordable for me. So <laughs> I will see the, the, the wood structure uh, at this occasion. OK, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Olivier. Given the time, there is maybe room for one short question from the audience. So, maybe, Olivier, maybe you can just um, tell us what, from your perspectives, are the main success factors that you could increase social clauses in the region of Strasbourg? Just maybe short. Um, I would say uh, proximity. Uh, we are um, a team of uh, facilitators. We are very close um, to the to the field. We know every inclusive uh, organization of the area. So we are able to speak about what the inclusive sector is able to do to the public buyers. And for me, it's the key uh, for the success. One, two, three, four. No, very, very quickly, I wanted to, under, uh, to understand if uh, in your service, do you also help uh, the contracting authorities to draft the tender documents or is it more to in the implementation? Um, we help them to write, like uh, I write the social aspects of the contract most of the time, yes. And so I can think about what was uh, well done in a contract to put it on a, uh, in, an, in another contract that is not uh, for the same uh, public authority. So uh, I share the good practices, in fact. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all our speakers um, for this really interesting session. I hope you got lots of good examples and practices that you can take to the coffee break and uh, talk a bit more about it. Okay, everyone, let's start because uh, the weekend is coming. But uh, before the weekend and the fun, uh, let's uh, let's get going again in this uh, second session. Uh, so the first session focused a little bit more on practical realities locally, what's happening, good practices, uh, and so forth. And uh, the second session will focus a little bit more around uh, the future of socially responsible public procurement. What can we do politically to drive things forward? What can we do? Uh, and when I mean politically, I mean it at the EU level, but also at local level, at regional level, uh, where actually public procurement is really uh, mostly used uh, in uh, Europe. So we have uh, a panel of speakers. Uh, we have, um, I, I might ask quickly for everyone just to briefly introduce themselves and their organization too. So let's start with Hayden. Thank you, Tom. Yes, my name is Hayden Hammersley. I am the social policy coordinator at the European Disability Forum. Um, so the European Disability Forum, as our name suggests, with the representative body of persons with disabilities to the EU and also to the Council of Europe. Thank you, Hayden. Uh, Kiran? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I am Kiran Mildred, and I work as a policy officer with Eurodiconia. And Eurodiconia is a network of European over 58 organizations that provide social and healthcare services. We provide a range of services ranging from care to persons with disabilities and employment services as well. Thank you. 
Thank you, Kevin, for joining us. Uh, and Matthias. Thank you, Matthias Maucher, Policy and Project Coordinator of Social Services Europe. We are a network of eight European umbrella organizations and covering the fields that Kevin just mentioned and also others. Thank you, Matthias. And last but not least, Simone. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. My name is Simone Skiru, and I am policy officer at Reuse, which is the European network of social enterprises active in reuse, repair, and recycling. So there are social economy actors active in the circular economy that primarily use reuse and repair as vehicles for inclusive job and training opportunities. Great. So that's it. We have, let's say, the main stakeholders here in Brussels um, representing uh, both uh, people with disabilities, but also much of the social economy, social services uh, sector. Um, effectively, those who are who are mostly um, who are very much so um, involved in socially responsible public procurement. Um, I mentioned at the start um, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which for EASPD is really the heart of what we try and implement it. Because if we're talking about a rather dry instrument like public procurement, it's not for the fun of it. It's because it can really make an impact in the lives of, uh, the pe of people uh, with disabilities, of those who we try and support. Um, so for us, it's always important to first hear from people representing uh, disabled persons. Um, we're talking about jobs. Uh, what does a quality job mean for people with disabilities? Thanks. Well, that's a, that's a huge uh, question. Uh, I think it's also something that we've kind of already discussed a little bit today. Uh, what's a quality job for a person with a disability resembles what's a quality job for, for everybody. So, um, sufficient pay, of course, and uh, safe and secure working conditions and contracts, uh, but also very much, um, and this is where the situation for persons with disabilities differs from from those without um is the focus on inclusion in the in the open labor market um on being included in all kinds of jobs and not being limited to certain sectors which are seen as uh, easier to integrate workers with disabilities than others so it's definitely having a good uh, quality of job when you get one but also having the choice to use your skills in any um any sector that interests you and where you have skills. Thank you. I think quite clear, like a job like everyone else, uh, but particularly for people with disabilities, then it's also uh, an issue around inclusion uh, and so forth. Um, public procurement can be used in different ways, not always in an inclusive way. So how would you see the use of public procurement when it comes to, to creating these quality jobs and how it can be used? Yeah, well, I mean, I've written down a lot, lots of things from the discussion um, that we, we just saw because it was very interesting to hear people working directly in the process of uh, public uh, procurement. I think maybe it's important to come um, back to the point of reserved contracts and the fact that there's definitely a focus on um, social enterprises in lots of countries. This is definitely a, something, you know, positive. It's definitely a good step for getting um, uh, more persons with uh, disabilities employed through public procurement. But I think we would like to see more in the way of, um, I think it was referred to as kind of classic uh, employment, but let's say mainstream businesses also being obliged to demonstrate some sort of inclusion in order to be eligible, eligible for certain calls. I think that's something that given how much of the EU's GDP goes through public procurement, it would be a, a huge change in the way that uh, employers approach including persons with disabilities and it would definitely give a big push uh, for, for them to take it more seriously so um, yeah I think perhaps not disregarding social enterprises but not using it as the only uh, route through which uh, public procurement can be used to boost the employment of persons with disabilities. Thank you. So in some ways, not only when we're talking about socially responsible public procurement, not only talking about reserved markets, but maybe especially and even more so talking about uh, social clauses uh, and issues like that. So to create jobs on the ordinary uh, labor market. Thank you. Um, and maybe do you have any final sort of recommendations for for, for this project and, and for ESPD as a whole in terms of um, our role in, 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 in helping to create change, this change that you're asking for? Well, first of all, I'd just say I'm, I'm so happy that you're all working on this 
uh, with so much uh, energy and I mean also to ESPD that you focus on this so much it's it's extremely useful and as you say it's not something something that automatically comes across as the um as the sexiest topic but it's very it's very useful so we're glad that you that you focus on it so much um yeah uh what would I say I mean continue focusing on these good examples that you're discussing but also definitely pinpointing the the bad examples or the areas in which perhaps public procurement isn't the best system to be used I know that we've discussed this with the ESPD before in terms of service provision for care services for persons with disabilities it's it's very hard to use public procurement for something which is so uh, personal to persons with disabilities where the issue of quality for what someone appreciates as personal care is very difficult to to describe with um, different criteria and indicators so it's it's something that's worthwhile pointing out where social procurement is is effective and where it works well and others where we should perhaps be be looking for other alternatives to to looking for service providers thank you very much hey i think we are 100 percent on agreement there at the spd when it comes to buying social services social care services we don't think public procurement is the best option quite far from it um, but we do see opportunities for for creating jobs for people uh, in that way so when it's related to employment it's a very positive thing i think what one aspect that we try to tackle in this in this project was specifically also um, not just limiting ourselves to the article 20 so it's about reserved markets um, but also looking beyond that um, the issue, though, is that even reserved markets, it's a challenge per se. And so we're asking to go a step further. And so that that relationship for us throughout the project is is something that that's quite that's quite ch challenging. And, and but it's important that we want to be challenged and we want to make progress. So um, that's something that we can come back to, uh, I think, later. Um, here one. So you work for Eurojaconia, so representing many, many services uh, around Europe. Um, you work also a lot in public procurement. You've done a report on the topic recently. Can you tell us a bit about this report? Sure. I did the report together with my colleague, Zenia, and I'm happy to see that she's in the room right there. And in this report, maybe I'll be repeating some of the things that we already discussed or the earlier speakers talked about on reserve contracts and talking, looking at the vital role it can play in social inclusion. Although we, we discovered without a uh, without dispute that this reserve contracts can play a huge role in employing people who are further from the labor market, we also saw that the fact that it's a soft law instrument doesn't make it easier. Because with the Article 20 we are talking about, there's a use of the language may, which may, leaves room for public authorities or contracting authorities and national authorities to, to either take it up or not take it up. And we saw in our report that in the few cases where it has been taken up, there's been a pushback. And because of the pushback, most of the public authorities shy away from using it at all. And we can go on to talk about the instances where there's been a pushback in the report. We looked at the case, the Norway, Norwegian case that we've been looking at. We looked at the Asadi case in Spain and the Konasi case where it's, there's been a, a pushback from for profit organizations saying, no, you cannot do this, or you're violating state aid rules or things like that. And we also saw that it could be, um, there was, we, in our report, we saw that there's no explicit definition of disadvantaged people or socially marginalized or disabled persons. And we saw the, I already talked about the reluctance from administration and contracting authorities. And we saw that there's also lack of knowledge and competence on different levels. So briefly, that's what our report focused on. Thank you, uh, Kiwan. Um, I looked a little bit into the reports before, and I see that there's talks, if I remember well, around uh, the future of procurement in Spain, in Norway, uh, also uh, Bulgaria, uh, how it can be used. Can you tell us a little bit about the lessons learned uh, around these experiences? I'm going to go to the lessons, but I'm looking at my notes because it's quite a technical thing to talk about without having a look at your at your notes. Um, the thing is, we there are crucial factors that decide the momentum for and success of reserve contracts, and one of them is the interest in the social factor and the market consultation. 
and we saw that we, it could still be used, but there's the importance of differentiating contracts or dividing them into lots, as was already discussed this, this uh, earlier this afternoon. And there is need for capacity building for public authorities. There's need for contracting authorities to know the socioeconomic impact of using reserve contracts. Instead of leaving people in uh, to depend on benefits, I'm not I'm not against benefits in any form. Why not use reserve contracts to empower the persons with disabilities to be able to earn their living and also empower them their dignity as a person? Thank you, Kevin. Um, Matthias, you've been working on public procurement for what since 1950s. Uh, in terms of the knowledge that you have, uh, you have a huge amount of knowledge around it. So please tell us a little bit more about. I think we've discussed many times this topic, and um, you see cooperation between public authorities and stakeholders as, as as a key to actually making sure that public procurement is used in the in the right way. And we saw it earlier in, in Strasbourg and also in, in here in Belgium. Um, can you tell us a bit more about how this cooperation could work? I will I will try and I would raise here three points to start with. So more from the political and after the, 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 the regulatory framework. So logically, I think what we all see when it's about in general labor market inclusion of disadvantaged persons, persons with disability, then normally what is important is that we have uh, common objectives huh, between governments, between ministries, between managing authorities about the EU funds, local authorities, logically regional authorities. And that's normally in all countries best backed up by national strategies and then targeted action programs. And they would be specific on what we talk here today. And this is even encouraged as my second point now by something that is rather recent at the EU level, but is a recommendation, a council recommendation on developing social economy framework conditions, because we talk here about not-for-profit organizations, non-governmental organizations, social economy, social enterprises, how you want to call this. And this could be, it's, a, it's an outcome of the social economy action plan from 221. This other is from November last year. And it could be a sort of hook or a springboard because the recommendations are addressed to the member states and the, the regions, the, the local governments in the member states. And there is a heading or that's called fostering access to the labor market and social inclusion. And as I will quote, I, I look to my paper because I don't know this by heart. But anyway, there is very clearly written that uh, member states are recommended to acknowledge and support the specific added value of the social economy by easing access to the labor market and promoting quality job for all. Um, and then there are also other issues on working conditions, health and safety by, and now it's Tom's po point, establishing or encouraging partnership initiatives that involve the social economy entities um, in the design and implementation of active labor market policies, also for persons with disabilities, ensuring that the public authorities, they give the sufficient support. It was mentioned before, it was mentioned here, financial support, so, uh, support with, with qualified staff on reasonable accommodation, on uh, supported employment, all the other issues uh, to, make, to make this labor market inclusion happening for the disadvantaged, but again here also for persons with disabilities. And also yeah, that there is, and that's written there in, in uh, from last year, November, so it's important for EISBD and others that are interested to uh, that uh, advise member states to work towards employment through work experiences in enterprises, work integration enterprises, but with the idea to go to the open, to the mainstream labor market. So that's a clear objective spelled out there. And also, uh, so that's my second point. And the, and the third would be that it's more, obviously, this can all be used um, if, if you use EU funds for more person-centered, for user-oriented, for community-based um, uh, services, so with a more inter innovative service design. I think we'll later speak about procurement, but also in state aid, I think it's important to look into this. And for state aid, we see from other studies, also done with Valentina, who is in the room and spoke before here earlier, um, that in general, what was last year revised, the de minimis uh, regulation, the general and the SGI de minimis regulation, that mostly this general de minimis regulation is used in member states. And other tools, like it's very complicated, but still I say the general block exemption regulation that allows, and that's important, uh, specific support, public support from public money 
for the training of disadvantaged, of dis disabled uh, persons, for um, wage supplements or support for the employment, for uh, giving money for reasonable accommodation, for supported employment, all these other assistance, personal assistance, all covered there. And that, that these, these, the, this, the money that is in there and the, the rules are really not sufficiently used, could be used better. And that's why there will be a revision likely of this tool. The others were revised in the last two years and are active of, of, of first uh, January this year. But there will be one on this tool that is key for the employment and for the training um, of, of persons with disability in 226 likely. And so that means indeed, let's use these tools that are there, they're already written, um, better to increase the employment rates of persons with disabilities and to go over these segregated settings to go into more inclusive uh, uh, enterprises, job designs, workplaces. This is all possible, and that would be in line also with the uh, when CRPD. Uh, so there is possibility to use public money, but you need to define it. It can also be done by public procurement to to uh, increase the employment rates, to give more money, and to work towards inclusive workplaces and inclusive labor markets. So that that is uh, that will be my three points to start with. Where are the hooks that can be used? State aid, the, the council recommendation on social economy, and in general action plans and and strategies uh, between public employment services, local government, and the social economy. Thank you, Matthias. A lot has been said. So I think just to come back through a few of those documents for, for those who aren't so so active in, in um, EU social policy domain, the Commission launched last year a social economy action plan. So they were trying to basically make sure that in each country, you have supportive policies, supportive policy frameworks that can enable social economy organizations to grow. Because it was mentioned earlier, if, uh, if a, a local provider wants, a local authority wants to subcontract to a, to a an organization, they need to have the organization that, that's there. And in some countries like France or Belgium, maybe that's quite clear, but in other countries, that's not the case. So it's also important the commission are trying to make sure that you, you can create these diversity of social enterprises, this sort of market per se, um, so that you can then use uh, socially responsible public procurement. Um, and the second one was around state aid. Uh, so that's another area where the EU can regulate and can legislate. Uh, and, and what we see quite a lot on the ground is that um, authorities tend to, a bit like in public procurement, they stay very, very safe. And and by staying very, very safe, they really um, hinder the development of opportunities for people with disabilities down the line, effectively. It's not about social services and it's not about social enterprises. What the real issue that we're talking about is the the opportunities for people with disabilities by not making the most uh, of it. So I think what, what I take from what you're saying is that, yes, we need to make sure we, we uh, strengthen the capacity of uh, authorities in using these tools, but it's also about showing, uh, enabling them to be more creative in the use of these tools as well. Uh, so it's not just about capacity on on the basics, but it's also knowing why you do something and how you do something, and to be creative in their use uh, as well. So I spoke maybe a bit too much uh, there as a as a um, as a middle ground. Um, but Simone, let's go to a specific area of the of the social uh, economy, which is more recycling types. Of of uh, of services, we talked about them them earlier. Um, we talked a little bit earlier around. Um, so, my understanding is that public procurement is used much more strongly when it comes to environmental criteria than social criteria. Can you tell us a bit more about how these environmental criteria are used, and maybe how can we learn from it in on, on the social side? Um, yes. So, first, a uh, disclaimer. Um, their green public procurement is used more than socially responsible public procurement, but that doesn't mean the green public procurement is even used enough. So that gives an even dimmer picture for socially responsible public procurement. So both of them are underutilized. The second one even more and was also highlighted uh, in the study conducted by Valentina to the European Parliament on behalf of the Foundation Bardolini. Um, a lot of the dispositions that are available in the public procurement uh, directive, which are current underutilized, like reserved markets, um, division of contracts into smaller lots, um, stakeholder consultations and the use of social and environmental considerations are, of course, applicable to both fostering socially responsible public procurement and environmental public procurement. With that being said, 
um, there is still a lot that needs to be done because when you only push for green public procurement, then you also do not allow proper recognition of the social added value of actors that actually work on both. And that is a case of our members, but also of members of many uh, other networks that are here present like ESPD as well. So that's uh, a big gap. And um, we need also a more holistic view to address the shortcomings of the directive, which as it was mentioned earlier, um, the, the directive is not perfect, but it's good. So there is a lot that needs to be done uh, at the local level to push for its implementation. And it's also reassuring this is not something that um, we are saying to each other working on EU social policy, but it has also been stated by the European Court of Auditors as early as last November, where it was highlighted that between 2011 and 2021, actually the level of competition in public procurement decreased from previous years. The level of single bidding and direct awards increased in the last 10 years. And um, even though introducing social and environmental considerations in the 2014 directive was a key objective to push for more socially responsible and green public procurement, um, the European Court of Auditors also um, stated that this has only happened to a very limited extent. So it's, it's reassuring in a way to know that it's not just us that are realizing the shortcomings, but there is more awareness from different stakeholders. What would help not only to push for more green public procurement, we've seen examples where reuse has been used in construction earlier. Um, this is also something that we have seen with members. Um, what would help with that is also uh, that socially responsible public procurement is integrated in sectoral legislation. As we have seen example in construction, that um, is a room of opportunity where socially responsible public procurement provisions can be included to foster both at the same time and also stop considering green public procurement separate from socially responsible public procurement. Uh, it's at the expense of actors that do both and also at uh, considering environmental legislation as opportunity to lift everyone uh, in society and not just big companies that might be finally interested in the circular economy. Um, and environmental legislation is indeed one big example, not only in construction, but also in the waste framework directive that regulates the circular economy, basically. Uh, we've seen that was a missed opportunity where there could have been more mentioning for a socially uh, responsible public procurement there, and it didn't happen. And it's a way to, while uh, we do not expect a revision of the directive, it's a way to push for a stronger implementation. This is, of course, one aspect where it could happen, because then we also need to work closely with public authorities and making sure that they have opportunities to be empowered, to have more knowledge about the social economy, and, and so forth. We had planned a second question for you, but I'm going to change that second question. We had planned a second question to you, but I, I might change it based on what on what you said. Uh, are you saying that we should not separate uh, public procurement from socially responsible public procurement? Public procurement is public procurement, and that in all public procurement we should be using social and environmental criteria. Is, is that your is that your take? Uh, my my take wasn't uh, about that. My take was that um, socially responsible and green public procurement can go together, especially in those sectors where there is an opportunity to push for what in Brussels is called an inclusive green transition, and it's not done. Both under underutilized, and there are opportunities also to push for both. For instance, socially responsible public procurement can be a part of procuring environmental services like reuse and repair, where uh, we see with our members that uh, the, some activities, the more circular they are, the more social inclusive they can be. So you're telling us that we should move out of our silos, out of our little social economy world and, and start working with other industri industrial worlds and trying to, to lobby them to create, to make sure that in their procurement policies that these aspects are included? Uh, well, I think we're doing already a good job at thinking externally and not necessarily in silos. Um, the, an example is reuse. We see the two going together. And of course, the social and green, of course, that, that is not applicable to every possible organization where they might focus primarily on social. And that is important and it needs to be happen. Uh, it becomes an opportunity 
for everyone to push for more social clauses also in a specific sectoral legislation, because it's important to have an ambitious public procurement directive, but there are also opportunities in other specific legislation that directly concern sectors to push the same dispositions of the 2014 directive there in order then to have more legislation that can push for its implementation. That's interesting because we use is doing that, but ESPD is not. So maybe we should learn from you on on, on working can, beyond our beyond our structures. Yeah, we can all learn from each other, of course. And I think that's the added value of these opportunities is also to compare each other reports and see um, how uh, we can bring keep, have your expertise, for instance, specifically on services for people with disabilities, and vice versa, uh, work together on. Um, lobbying for more social environmental legislation and that happened for instance in our recent open letter for the waste framework directive yeah thank you thank you very much uh, are there any questions from the participants i think there's a question from valentina and then yeah It's a question, but it's, well, I mean, it's also a, a reflection from uh, what you said uh, in this panel and in the previous panel. Uh, working in silos, we know that uh, <laughs> all organizations tend to work in silos. So Simone was saying that the green and the social should go hand in hand. And I fully agree with you, even if uh, it's not so easy to be done. Uh, but uh, I fully agree that we should do it uh, uh, more. Uh, there is also the, the aspect of uh, social economy, social enterprises working together with uh, the private sector. And uh, the, um, uh, when you, um, you said uh, it's true that the mindset is very different, and, uh, uh, but I think uh, it's about uh, choosing the right uh, conventional business because there are some which are good you know and maybe uh, with uh, which uh, it is possible to work and if you take the, the example from uh, Valonia I don't know if uh, they are still here but uh, maybe also from uh, from France Strasbourg you can find uh, examples where the business sector works with the social economy uh, and uh, this is something that, uh, uh, so there is the dialogue between uh, the social economy and the public uh, buyers for sure, but there is also dialogue to be developed between uh, the social economy and uh, the private sector. I, what do you think about this? <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, Enrique? So um, I think the point you made about that social and environmental aspects should go together is really important and interesting because at the moment I feel that everything is focused so much on the environmental issues and the climate issues, which is important. And I think in Austria, we also see that the public procurement requirements for the ecological parts are much more developed already. And if you, then you lack out the social aspects, I think that's really like a pity because it's important to look at this as well and i was wondering whether you have concrete examples where you have i think for example when you think about housing that this is like something i think when you have where you could have like ecological climate friendly renovation and then also have it social housing something provisions like this do you have concrete examples that you could share maybe on this aspect where you have worked in that area Um, yes, absolutely. We have different examples internally, and we're um, also finalizing a new report, which will be presented on April 18th here in Brussels. So you're all welcome to register and, and join the discussions, uh, because this report presents different case studies where you have both social and environmental considerations. And of course, this shouldn't 
necessarily be the norm in every scenario because it might not be applicable. But as you said, there are important sectors where both can be combined. Construction is one of them. Uh, we uh, have several case studies that specifically focus on that. One of them uh, actually concerns the Paris 2024 Olympics preparation, which was also brought up earlier. And that is an example where the contracting authorities around the Paris Olympics preparation, they uh, consulted social enterprises to make sure that instead of building new buildings for the athlete villages, they were renovating and reusing furniture to um, save CO2 emissions, while at the same time also making sure that these contracts would allow uh, people from marginalized groups in general, including people with disabilities, to partake in these activities. Um, so in this uh, specific case, they did so also through a, uh, a facilitator uh, that was called S uh, S S so E S S uh, twenty twenty four guided by different social enterprises like Licano, and they put in touch social enterprises with the contracting authorities to make sure that these contracts were accessible for social enterprises, while at the same time also uh, the objectives of the Paris 2024 were being achieved, which uh, it's no doubt that this is also an expertise that many of our respective members already carry. They know how to combine both. That is, for instance, one example, and we will have also panel discussion there, and I encourage you to read through the different case studies that will come up. Uh, but I also have an, uh, an additional one that I was supposed to be a follow-up question, but I, I guess I can bring it up now. Uh, it's a case study from uh, Croatia, and our member, uh, Umana Nova, which is also an EASPD member, um, they are featured in one of these case studies because they fulfilled a public contract for the production and delivery of flags. These flags were uh, flags about like Croatian flags, Zagreb city flags, EU flags with upcycle material. And um, this is a social enterprise that primarily works with people with disabilities. Uh, in this specific contract, they went over the minimum requirement of 51% of people, um, uh, mar marginalized groups that needed to be employed, reaching 60%. And uh, in this way, they created opportunities that are both uh, social and but also good for the environment. These were uh, flags produced locally, uh, upcycled, so a lot of CO2 emissions saved there. And at the same time, having the opportunity to undertake this contract, even though it came with challenges, because they can be very complex to, to follow and execute. Uh, they were actually able to increase their uh, activities, creating uh, additional jobs actually for uh, the people that work at Umana Nova. So there are examples, uh, publications like those brought up before can help also to raise awareness and inspire also more uh, innovation for public procurers that can also be a little um, risk adverse um, but we have good examples, and I think opportunity like these are good because we can also make sure that we're all aware of the different work that we're doing and bring this old data together to policymakers. Thank you, Simone. Uh, also for citing an ESPD member, there's some free advertising. Um, but also good that we, we have common members too. Um, there's a question by Olivier in the back. Yeah, thank you. Um, when the public buyers they uh, they are setting the the criteria uh, of the the call for tender, they have to set only criteria that are uh, directly in link with the object of the contract. Don't you think it's an issue uh, when you are thinking about the environmental and social uh, question? Would anyone like to respond? Well, I can try and start answering it. Not an easy question to answer because I would think it depends on the specific contract. Um, and also I'm not an expert on the subject matter specifically, and this seems to focus primarily on that. Um, so maybe if you can elaborate maybe examples of contracts where you encounter that was difficult. Uh, what I mean is that uh, when the, the companies, they answer the, the tender, they have to speak about what they are doing in the social field during the execution of the contract. And you cannot um, speak about what is your strategy uh, 
in general on the field of uh, uh, integration and so on. You have to speak about only uh, what is directly in link with the the, the contract. If you if you are um, uh, uh, building uh, something, the only consideration that you could speak about in in your answer as a company is what you are going to do while this contract is um, achieved. And I wonder if it's it's not um, an issue for the inclusive companies that they cannot um, like uh, show that they are uh, in a way uh, doing things, but maybe they are doing things in general and not exclusively in the contract that is uh, uh, published. Uh, I can uh, elaborate a bit on this. Uh, all uh, the social criteria, but also the environmental criteria that are included in uh, tender documents have to be linked uh, with uh, the subject matter of the contract. Hmm? And this is a very a technical requirement. It's uh, easier to do it with uh, environmental criteria, while uh, well, the argument that you very often uh, hear is that uh, uh, for contracting authorities, it is more difficult to ensure this link with the subject matter when it comes to social criteria. And to give you a very concrete example uh, in the field of uh, disability. So uh, if you include a, uh, a social clause uh, in a work criteria or also in a contract performance clauses, for example, to employ a number or a percentage of persons with disabilities or um, other disadvantaged persons, it can be done only for the duration of the contract. No, it's not, uh, uh, you cannot put uh, as a contracting authority a requirement to employ a disadvantaged person, I mean, in a permanent way, no? So, uh, and uh, I discussed with the commission when uh, I drafted the, the 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 study for the parliament that for me this uh, I mean they could uh, think of uh, relaxing this requirement uh, when it comes to um, employment opportunities for persons uh, with disabilities or other disadvantaged groups because it's basically you can employ people but on a temporary basis for stop. It's better than uh, being without uh, a job, for sure. But uh, we're already talking of uh, vulnerable people and uh, maybe there are other solutions. No? <laughs> Thank you, Valentina. Uh, Matthias, you want to come in? Yeah, a, sh a short reaction. So a very good remark or question from Olivier, I think. And in the field we are working directly, social services is not the biggest issue because there is about social services and then you look into continuity, accessibility, affordability and all the other issues. But I fully agree that this is an issue. And again, I already talked about state aid before and at a conference we had on the social economy, somebody from Balunia again talked about this, that he wanted an advice, a yes or no question on can he, and that's your question, can I fund social economy enterprises for what they are, namely that they permanently do it, or also what Valentina said, that they in general have 30, 50, 70 percent of employment and not only for the contract, and they want to do it in general and not when the contract is over. And the answer of the legal service of the Walloonian government was five-page document with no answer. So, non uh, pas conclusive. So, and that was that was the mes message. And everybody laughed in the room, but it's a bit, it's a very bitter laugh. And so, I I like what Valentina also said, and he, the same could be done here, because the problem is, and that's EU law problematic. There is always a hindrance if you want to favor uh, something that you want to that you could favor because it's in the values of the EU treaties, it's in the policies of the pillar of social rights, it's everywhere, it's in the treaty, in the treaty articles, that you want to have inclusive societies, but you cannot support a social economy and not-for-profit organization for this because then you favor a type. 
And that is something that is uh, in the in a, uh, error in the construction of the EU legislation because the fear is that there is no level playing field anymore. But that is the added, added social and economic value or ethical value that we have by these organizations in our society. And if it's not valued, then we have an issue. So that would be also something to very much think about. And it applies also again in state aid. It's not only a procurement issue. Thank you, Matthias. I, I will turn a bit to, to Hayden because what we try and do here is ultimately public procurement is it's about creating jobs for, for people with disabilities. And at least in, in the um, discussions around disability rights, it's uh, in some ways uh, open labor market or ordering labor market or first labor market, I think in, in Austria, good. And social economy, protected employment, bad. In some ways, at least. Um, here we've been talking quite a little bit around reserved markets, which means you know creating jobs for people. But it's also a little bit the reality, right? It's the we have these instruments, we have these organisations that are focused on that. Do we want to abandon them completely, or do we want to support them for public procurement, or how should we how should we see this? It's it's a very difficult question. I I know, but your your thoughts and and thinking about this would be useful for us. Yeah, I mean, I don't think we're at a stage where we can turn away from reserve markets, they they definitely serve a purpose. The issue is more that there's a risk and it's more an issue of controlling the quality of uh, social enterprises because we of course have social enterprises that are very good. Uh, we have some countries that have quite high quality social enterprises such as in, in Spain, for example, they have very good, uh, some very good uh, systems. Um, but these reserved uh, contracts can also be used as was mentioned today for by um sheltered workshops so this is also something that when that's the case it's definitely not promoting quality employment and inclusion i mean you have uh i don't know what uh, example to give i don't know um sheltered workshops uh where people are making envelopes all day and then they don't have a proper work contract they're being paid i don't know a few euros pocket money uh per week um and yeah, it's more of a kind of day center than than uh, proper employment. So yeah, the issue is more controlling the quality of what we class as a social enterprise and not under that title, um, allowing sort of low quality sheltered workshops to deliver these services. There was something, it wasn't your, it wasn't your question, but it was also something I just wanted to bring up, um, which is that the, uh, well, pub public procurement isn't just about, uh, producing jobs for persons with disabilities, but it's also about producing a society for persons with disabilities. So what we also want to see are very clear uh, calls for tender where there are specifications on accessibility requirements, where through the use of public procurement, we'll be building societies where the public spaces um, are more accessible, where the transport, if that's also done through public procurement is more accessible, where the services are more accessible. So it's also about the end product of the public procurement that's going to make a better you know society for persons with disabilities and not just whether they're involved in the production of that end result is as employees so it's just something that was was on my mind as we were discussing thank you i think this is really too often these discussions around public procurement are uh, around technical issues and we you know we we, we sort of say yeah, any use of reserved markets is good. Uh, and I think it's important to have a voice like what you've just said, which says a little bit more nuanced position around these issues, because um, again, public procurement is not, or socially responsible public procurement is not just about um, buying uh, something. It, it, it's it's also about the impact that we're trying to do. So thank you for bringing that perspective. Um, when um, uh, Hayden was speaking, I heard some noise over here. So I, I, I feel that you want to come in, Kevin. Um, yeah, I just wanted to comment a little bit about sheltered workshops because I remember Daikoni Deutschland they do have sheltered workshops and we have sheltered workshops in Czechia also. And I think we are talking about real persons here and real experiences. When I was preparing for this event, one one colleague told me about a cousin of his and a sister of his who could not find a job in Germany and could only work in this shelter workshop. So I, I think we, we can advocate for more inclusive markets, but we cannot also face out the importance of the sheltered workshops. 
I just wanted to give that part of it that although it depends on the level of disability as well, because there are people with a higher level of disability who may not necessarily fit in the general labor market. So I just wanted to put that out there. Definitely a, a complicated discussion and, and, and worthy of a, a week long discussions ahead on that. I mean, it's the same for our CSPD have also as members who are shadow workshops. Um, but our, our, our objective is to try and transform them into creating these quality jobs uh, and quality opportunities also for, for Hayden. But I, I understand the complexity of it, but it's important to have these discussions because um, too often we separate the two, but we shouldn't. Um, Matthias, you've been silent. Um, is there anything that you would like to come in and say? And if we have now spoken about EU funds and state aid, so I can then add something on procurement because that's the topic here. And in a way, um, I think, and that there I would really like to congratulate the project uh, uh, partners uh, for having done this declaration that also Miguel mentioned on socially responsible public procurement as as a key deliverable. Because if when I when I reflected what are on on procurement issues that are important, then I could really look into uh, these articles. But again, this is on, we talked about earlier, and it's not technical, it's very practical. Division in smaller lots, no? that helps social economy, also general smaller, uh, small, medium enterprises. And then the issue that was brought up nicely by, by Michael Longino and then taken up also now by our French colleague, with and, and Valentina, um, I think that's really not, not thought about with which private for-profit companies can you cooperate to do this subcontracting in a way that it's helpful for both. That might be something. Um, again, more when it's on goods probably and on, and, and on services, not in the social services sector. And so all the points that you have also in here, and that was now said by, by Hayden and, and again by, by Simone. So we also think that the procurement directive as such is really rich and can be much better exploited than it is. That's on this accessibility and design for all. That's all in. You can set this as a requirement. It's not forbidden. It, 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 please do it. Be encouraged. Or what we now discussed again, all this more towards everything supported employment, um, in uh, place placement services, and so on, everything that is going towards the first, the mainstream uh, labor market that can all be uh, requ required. And then the award criteria that was said, the best uh, quality price ratio or this most economically advantaged tender, that's all there. There is this so-called special regime for social services. We look again into our sector with all the quality criteria that are also in, in relevant quality frameworks. So this can all be def defined, even empowerment, even user participation. So to go beyond this affordability, accessibility, continuity, the more technical issues from a provider's perspective, but really looking at also the user. So that's all there. And, but again, here, if, if you allow me two, three seconds now on, on, on why is this also so problematic? I think it, it comes in the study that, that uh, Valentina did perfectly well for the parliament. And we really can, I can only say that you look into this. And when we work on this topic, there is really a mix of a fear of the of the contracting authorities that, uh, as also Simone said, are risk adverse to have on the one hand, especially if you think about emergency services, also care services, support employment, for example, you want a continuity. You cannot say we wait for three years and nothing happens. So you, you, you cannot allow delays in attributing a market. So that's why you go for the safer, for the easier, for the standard. Then there is, and obviously the recourse in courts against the attribution of markets. And it's sometimes also done like uh, Trump does it for procedural reasons, only to delay, delay, knowing that they will not win. But obviously, if you are courageous and put in more quality criteria and other issues, uh, also the what is in the in the directive, the compliance with collective agreements, really very, very important, good working conditions, decent working conditions, labor rights uh, be complied in supply chains, all these other issues. So the, if you put this in, it's more complicated and somebody can attack it and at least block it for two, three years, even if at the end you win and then new I spoke with somebody of the of the Limburg province here in, in Belgium only yesterday, 
again, now what is the new fear is are the audit offices, the national audit offices that want to be the champions and then will 10 years later say, oh, this little criteria was not correct, you have to pay back state aid, or that was not done. And that's a real, real fear. And then you go for the safest, for the non-problematic. And what can happen there is really, as it's done in the project that Valentina has presented, not only training, but capacity and capacity in a way it was nicely presented by the Walloonian colleague and the French colleague that there is a network of experts and a cooperation of the local regional governments and they exchange on good practice and if it works in Strasbourg it can work in Reims and it can work in Bordeaux and it could work in Karlsruhe and so on and so on so that you really have these things you bring in these models Sweden is a good example where the national agency defines models templates to do good supply chain, to do uh, quality social services, whatever it is. So there are national models. And with this, then local authorities feel safe and they, ca they can go for it. And then last point here, also local government, what we always see, or regional, there is often not enough conversation and cooperation between, call it, the, 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 the social and the labor uh, department in a local authority on a region, and then the treasury. And the treasury is always for the lowest price. And it was said before because somebody could come and say, taxpayers' money uh, was the Austrian example, but why did you spend so much more? So, and uh, I, that I know from a discussion we had in Germany now, uh, two hours on this, only on this regional government, district government, and so on. They, they claim that they speak, but then in the pause, somebody said, oh, all what we said is not really true. We don't speak too much. And I make very progressive tenders and the treasury, the finance office cuts it off because it's too complicated. If you add this, then it's a risk that somebody will go against, that you have added something on supported employment that's not safe, that you have added something on inclusive labor market, that you have added something on more relative share on the quality than on the price. It's all to be attacked and it can be attacked and then they don't do it. So there is on, on le level several uh, uh, grounds uh, where, where you can really, uh, and construction sites where you can really work. But most importantly is the implementation side and use the existing legislation, but look there that people are encouraged, that, that these decision makers are encouraged and it's politically back to go for much more and then it can work. Thank you, uh, Matthias. Uh, always a lot of um, a lot of content, which is which you know is um, meriting uh, thought. I think so. I'm struggling to to speak because I'm I'm trying to to um, think about. For for me, when I when I hear what you say, um, it just makes me think about one thing, and it's actually one of the conclusions of this project is we need public authorities, whatever the level, to have like action plans and strategies where they bring this all together. Because if, if you don't have at local authority level, for example, a an action plan where which is backed by the local politicians um, that effectively instructs not only uh, the procurers, the buyers of the services, but also the treasury, the finance department to come together, then, you, then you're not really going to make progress. So I think it highlights the importance of, of having this local action plans, but actually that brings um, the different stakeholders in together to achieve a political ambition. Uh, and, and without that, then you're always going to have these little fights uh, and so forth. So maybe the commission could could push a little bit more around that that, that political um, and partnership based uh, approach. Um, I said to, to Matthias that he's been silent for a bit, and, and now I go to my left and I see Simone. Um, what do you think about all this? Well, that's a very open question that <laughs> can go in many directions. Um, so what do I think of this? I completely subscribe to what Matthias has just said and also um, the position of Eurodiaconia, of course, uh, reserved markets cannot be um, one size fits all solutions, especially when the ultimate goal is social mobility and all of that. I also subscribe to what they said because uh, we are in a context where um, Social in, in this case, social enterprises do not have a fair opportunity to participate in public procurement. The end goal of what they do is for these employees to have a stronger social mobility chance and, of course, then to have more and more options uh, for personal fulfillment. And the way that I see reserved markets is a positive discrimination tool to ensure those that can compete are not only with the lowest price which I think that also can go hand in hand with the fair concerns that have been shared by Hayden. 
to uh, add on additional things that the European Commission can do uh, beyond uh, continuing to provide in, uh, guidance that can be applicable to contracting authorities and uh, also setting up initiatives where contracting authorities are also together with specific stakeholders like the um, initiative mentioned by Valentina on gathering social economy stakeholders with them to provide these opportunities of collaboration. I think from Brussels, what the commission can do is also to make sure that national public procurement legislation is properly encouraged and monitored. And that is something also that uh, current mechanism already in place like the European semester. So this big macro coordination mechanism on social and employment policies, this is a place where the European semester can come uh, and play and play a role. There are specific recommendations every year from the commission to all the member states, um, which should help also and make sure that they're called on acting for better public procurement. As we have seen from the European Court of Auditors as a general malaise of this directive at the moment, the fact that there is a lack of implementation, and that's where it's very important to act at the local level. Thank you, Simone. We have a question from the crowd. This is not a question, it's a reflection. Uh, I was, it was really, really interesting discussion about uh, the challenge for the local authorities and how involved social economy organizations, but honestly, um, I have to be polite. Uh, you can push at EU level to to have like favorable um, measures or regulations for improving the participation of social economy entities into public procurement. But as you said, if we are not involved, for example, controllers and public servants in the planification and elaboration of uh, public contracts, it's impossible. Okay, um, you can be a politician. You can have like a good ideas and try to implement your uh, your uh, electoral program. But honestly, the public administration uh, has public servants that control all the steps in the implementation of the contracts. Um, if are not clearly defined, the social me measures of the social clauses is impossible to apply for, for these kind of entities. Um, and it's in Spain, it's related to the, to the object of the contract. And if you're not promoting adding value for the previous service you're applying for, it's impossible to, you to get the contract. And the second reflection or idea or that I would to ask to, ask to you is, okay, I come in from Canterbury region, a small region, not just from the Marina de Cudillo City Council, around 5,000 inhabitants, only like 11, 11 public servants working in the administration, okay? But uh, there are real cooperation within social economy organizations, like to apply for the for the contracts, because uh, if we take a look in our region and other regions, we have a huge crusade uh, umbrella organizations as a social economy entities, but they are like a small entities trying to apply for these kind of contracts. And you know, the, the, the market is not really big. So if we cooperate and we try to like uh, uh, divide in, into lots, the huge contract is uh, favorable for them, but they have to cooperate together. And they have to uh, complementary these services, trying to create like a making a benchmarking, how to promote the quality of these services. But if we don't have a real conversation together with the social economy entities, we are going to apply for this this contract with uh, trying to get more profits or uh, in this uh, service, but not uh, creating networking together. And I think, especially in local level, local and regional level, is sometimes is quite difficult to put all the entities in the table and discussing on, on, honestly how we can't uh, cooperate or how we can apply for these kind of contracts. Sorry. Critical opinion. It's what we need on a Friday afternoon, some uh, critical opinions to keep us uh, alive and awake. Um, okay, we are soon uh, closing up shop uh, until the, the, the concluding remarks. I don't know if anyone would like to bring in some final comments. Sorry, uh, Simone. Uh, just to uh, answer indeed, it's the, these are these are fair concerns. We also hear um, from our members how that is often the case. I think the 
what we're debating is not that there should be one solution in every possible geographical area in the EU, but actually it will not lead nowhere. We have to take into consideration also the different aspects, uh, proportionate uh, interventions and so forth. And indeed, it, it, it is difficult for contracting authorities to possibly bring together all social economy actors of the area. And lack of visibility is one important um, challenge of these actors. Uh, oftentimes, even the social economy entities themselves are not aware of all the other actors in the same sphere operating. So it's certainly not a responsibility that has to fall solely on uh, contracting authorities. And I think here what really helps, um, generally speaking, is also that policy interventions, including those that come from Brussels, help also social economy enterprises and all the different actors, service providers to come together and to synergize where possible. And here, consortia can play a great role because they can gather together resources, know-how, the role that we have seen also with specific organizations that act as intermediator, that can help social economy actors to apply to public tenders. Division of contract into smaller lots is one possibility that should be assessed, not, again, one size fits all solution because it can not be applicable everywhere. And that was my concluding remarks. Thank you, Simone. Um, that covers basically what I what I wanted to say uh, in this session. So now I would like to uh, thank all the speakers for for being here today. And and I think we need to continue to work on these topics together um, to try and convince the Commission firstly that socially responsible public procurement or public procurement has a social dimension should be higher up on the agenda uh, because right now in the Commission it's not uh, very clearly it's not uh, no one from the Commission uh, is here today and so that's a big uh, issue I think um, uh, but yeah let's work together to, to make sure that we keep this high up on the agenda um, I'd like to invite Franz Wolfmeier uh, to maybe come up and say some concluding remarks or from there yeah. perfect yeah. Yeah, thank you for this interesting discussion. Uh, I want to bring uh, my final <laughs> remarks back to the project we had here. And the name of the project was Community Resilience by uh, the use of social procurement. So uh, when I uh, started to work in ASPT as vice president in 2004, this was the first directive who came up about procurement. And I remember quite well, we were sitting in Paris. The French uh, had the, uh, the presidency of the EU at that time. And there was no word about social in the procurement directive. We were really <laughs> uh, disappointed and we pushed very hard. And uh, in the evening at the social event then came up uh, the reason why this is, uh, is because the directive was uh, developed by DG uh, competition. So, but they, the directive was there. So we had to work with it and it lasted 10 years with close cooperation of all the networks in the social platform to convince the commission to include social uh, aspects and one important point was we had we brought uh, ASPD organized study visits for the uh, people from the from DG competition to see what we are talking about because they thought it's the same like uh, uh, waste uh, and water <laughs> and so on uh, yeah, at the end, we know we have 2014 and we have a new direction after 10 years. Then the st it started again to bring that to the states because the states had to implement it. Uh, there was no idea to implement it proper and many of uh, networks then in their states uh, started to convince uh, the, the developer of this uh, new legislation to to implement it and yeah i think in most of the countries we were successful and this is now the case and now with this project we try to bring it to the communities and small communities so we had Kleistorf, eleven thousand inhabitants we had Mar uh, Mar 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 
uh, how many inhabitants? 5,000. 5, and we had Dobrich from Bulgaria. Uh, yeah, 60,000, I think. And in Dobrich and in Gleisdorf, nobody have, has heard about social criteria in procurement up to this moment when we uh, came up with this project. Uh, I think Spain was a bit more advanced already. Yeah, and this is the situation. So uh, looking to the, the communities, they have the situation that to, to, yeah, their problem is to keep it local. So they want to keep <laughs> contracts uh, done by uh, local enterprises and so on. That's the the idea behind. So we have to find synergies to help them to keep it local. And that uh, is what we developed during this project. And I think the results are quite good. So we have uh, uh, a, a, a brochure with good examples. We have uh, the declaration. We have some strategies and action plans from uh, from some communities, and we have a paper, a very good paper, I think, about uh, implementation. And so there we are now, <laughs> and uh, I think uh, the next steps really to implement it has to be on the local level. For uh, And we, I would also ask ESPD and all the networks here to help their members how to implement it on the local level. I think that's uh, the key. Otherwise, uh, discussions are always there. I think important is, and we have it also, you mentioned it, Enrique, in, the, in Austria, in the green sector, in the ecological sector, we have already uh, a lot of criteria which are accepted by all and no problem. And we have to come to that point also on national levels, but we have to help the communities and the, the organizations on the basis so that's i think my, shortly my my conclusion from uh from today but also from the project the two years project and i want to thank very much all the partners here uh, who contributed and also the speakers we had already like olivier in in Kleistow at that conference uh, we learned a lot during this uh yeah two years and Especially, I want to thank EISPD and also Miguel for this perfect project management. Thank you very much. Yeah, I hope I didn't forget somebody. <laughs> and then I can say only have a nice Friday evening. <laughs> and uh, I hope we, we find ways to cooperate in the future in that, yeah. Uh, idea to implement it on local level.